Hi there, welcome back to the Non-Serbian Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, as always. And today, in an unprecedented number of guests, I have three gentlemen from Fakertarians, which, well, I have to explain to you what that is. I don't know. Can you um, tell me what Fakertarians is? Sure. Um, so I feel like I need to go a little bit into the history for that, just to kind of explain everything, because... It's definitely been a little bit of a ride. So we started, I think it was May 2017. Uh, I think the page would, was originally called, and it wasn't named by me originally. It was named by someone else who started it with me. I think it was called Liberty Hangout is a venereal disease or something like wow. that. And, <laughs> and that was only for like a day or two. And uh, so what we were doing was we probably had like 10 likes on Facebook at the time or something like that. We were just taking screenshots from a bunch of different Liberty Hangout articles or tweets or whatever, and just commenting on them and kind of mocking them and pointing out how these guys are a bunch of Trumpers and not just libertarians. So over time, it expanded a little bit beyond Liberty Hangout, and there's a lot of there's a lot of history there. I feel like we've gone we've gone after a bunch of different groups. Um, some, well, I'd say most kind of on the on the far right, like the alt-right types, but then sometimes some tankies and stuff like that too. But basically it started as, we saw an issue in the liberty movement where people were just uh, representing themselves as libertarians, but they really seemed like anything but, like they wanted to build the wall or mm -hmm. uh, Rothbard's thing about unleashing the cops or something like that. So fakertarians has just always been a way to well, first point that out so that people are actually aware of some of the issues that kind of lurk beyond the surface, but also a way to push back on those. Um, all of that sound that checks out. Uh, I had actually forgotten about Liberty Hangout, which was a truly horrendous Twitter account, mostly that turned full monarch cath Catholic extremist just not even worth talking about um did you just get ptsd flashbacks or yes something? i did you just completely <laughs> forgot and it all came back to you oh, yeah, forgetting was a good thing I, I yeah i it's good to not have seen them anywhere of late um but yeah you guys are you have a website you're very active on twitter you're on blue sky you're on, you're on every platform that i and also non serve room is on i've noticed so um I guess, you know what, let, let me just say who, who we're all talking to here. Um, I've never done a three-person interview before, but we have John, who is the co-founder of Fakertarians, um, who was just talking. He's a criminal defense attorney and has written extensively about the problems with the alt-right in the liberty movement. Sure has. Um, we have Alec, mysterious no last name, a law student, and former Mises Caucus volunteer turned cosmopolitan anarchist turned who knows. Volunteer on the Vermin, Vermin Supreme campaign, and conciliary. Conciliary. Extraordinaire. <laughs> extraordinaire. Uh, he calls himself an anarcho neoliberal because it pisses everyone else off, which, you know, that's fair. And I'm going to ask him about that maybe later. And we have Jeremy Kantorowitz, um, a workforce analyst and full time cat dad, very good, who joined Fakertarians in 2020 and is passionate about liberty and calling out bad elements in the liberty movement, which, yes, we're going to do that. Um, I have so many different things I want to ask about, but um, who, do, like, who's, who does what and like how do you kind of decide who's the voice of Fakertarians? If we do anything wrong, it's John's fault. <laughs> Very good. I mean, it kind of started as, since I think I'm... Well, I think there's maybe one or two other, I'm trying to think, other original founders that are still kind of with, with the page. But generally, I kind of took the reins on things from the beginning. I thought um, it was you, but I was never 100% sure. Yeah. Ever, you know. It's generally me when something's getting posted. But I mean, Jeremy posts on Twitter a lot too. Uh, but it's we don't really have like a, a set procedure for who's posting things i mean it's pretty much like oh you want to post something go for it uh unless we're unless we're doing something sensitive or something i think could uh cause legal issues or something like that or 
we're setting off some big fight with someone. Usually I, I give the okay on that before we go forward with it. But it is kind of, uh, we, we have a lot of people here, so it is kind of a collaborative effort. Mm-hmm. Um, Everything good is me. Everything bad is John. It's just as simple <laughs> as that sometimes. That's the motto. The, yeah. The family crest. Yeah. Um, I guess I want to ask you all, all of you a little bit how you got to libertarianism, but also how you, you know, fully shied away from what I think we would all agree the libertarian party, the kind of libertarianism, quote unquote, that they're, that they're doing right now. Um, and I also would have associated before their, the Mises caucus takeover with, you know, Lou Rockwell.com, the pale libertarian class, the people that I think, you know, any social anarchists who are listening assume all libertarians are like, and you guys are kind of here to, uh, prove otherwise but um for uh kit start, starting with john i guess but um okay yeah so i'm happy to start out um yeah, liberty so journey i was actually growing up um in the early 2000s i was actually a pretty hardcore republican like i was uh i was i was younger but i was rooting for bush to win the first election <laughs> and yeah. rooting for bush to get reelected, and then i supported uh Uh, In the Republican primary in 2008, I actually supported Rudy Giuliani at first. That's Uh, weird. After the, I know, after the 2008 election, I kind of just, I started to take a look at my views a little bit. And I was always, because I was always kind of parroting things. I mean, I was in high school at the time. So Mm -hmm. I was parroting things about how, uh, how I'm small government and stuff like that. And then I'd look at some of my views and it'd be like, wait, if I want a massive police state, to crack down on a bunch of drugs how how is that small government so it kind of set something off in my head like huh maybe there's something i should take a little bit of a look at here and i do i mean obviously a lot of people tell this story i do remember seeing ron paul in the 2008 debates and i liked him but at the time since i was kind of more into the the hardcore republican wing i thought he was like too soft on foreign policy and uh he was kind of crazy but like then the I listened with Giuliani that we've all oh, yeah. to in the past. Yeah. yeah, no, I I remember watching that live when it happened. But I was on I was on Giuliani's side at the time. But <laughs> after the election, I kind of thought about it a little more. Like, oh, maybe this guy has a point. So I started delving into libertarianism a little bit. Um, a lot of uh, reading. Uh, I got into some no Rothbard books at that time, but some Rothbard articles, like just some stuff on LouRockwell.com. Um, I started watching some people on YouTube, whether it be Adam Kokesh at the time. Um, sadly, sadly, Stefan Molyneux at the time before (laughs) when I didn't realize he was running a call and before he went off the deep end or Mm -hmm. further off the deep end. Mm -hmm. Um, and by, I would say, fall of 2010, uh, I considered myself an anarcho-capitalist. And I don't think my views have probably changed a little bit over the years. Like, I think I've gone a little bit more leftward. Uh, Probably 2012, 2013, I started getting into C4SS a little bit and kind of reading a lot of that. But generally, I don't call myself an anarcho-capitalist anymore because I think it brings about depictions of people like Hans Hermann Hoppe or (laughs) uh, Rockwell with his paleo stuff or the the paleo era era of Rothbard. But I think what I really saw go wrong in the liberty movement, and obviously there's a long history of this from the Ron Paul newsletters to uh, the Rothbard Rockwell report, which was around the same time, uh, to some of Hans Hermann Hoppe's stuff that was under the surface. But it seemed like around the rise of Trump, uh, everyone just kind of went crazy. I I just... Yeah, and it was... I had always... And knowing what I know now about Molyneux, I definitely have more than have some reservations about some of the stuff, uh, some of the old stuff. But I remember him, I always thought of him as like this really, really principled guy who would is always against government action and stuff like that. And I remember him even refusing to vote for Ron Paul because he thought that was too statist. Wow, that is a pure man. 
Yeah, and then he switches to supporting Trump, and I'm like, why is Ann Coulter on his show? Yeah. And it just, it really just threw me for a loop. And it seemed like it, even the like the Mises Institute at the time kind of revived uh, what I refer to as the paleo strategy from the yeah. from the '90s, where they were really trying to go hard, hard toward Trump supporters. And I also feel like Hoppe got a lot more popular around that time too, kind of in those internet. 4chan alt-right subculture things yeah uh so that I, that's kind of what we're still dealing with right now where a lot of libertarianism is just well so-called libertarianism is just contrarianism and edge learning basically it's true the democrats were more right than i ever thought they <laughs> would be um alec do you have a journey yeah so uh my dad's an immigrant he came from the former Yugoslavia as a kid. My mom was the first one born here. So I grew up a, in an immigrant family, which was interesting because my parents were hardcore neocons mm. uh, before kind of falling for the Trump bullshit. Can we swear on this show, by the way? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, just making sure. I just realized that was the first. Uh, I already have a bunch of so for sure. So. <laughs> yeah, just, just double checking. Um, so growing up, I then supported Obama just to piss my parents off. I was born in 2000, so I was literally a 9-11 baby. Yeah. Um, so growing up in the shadow of 9-11 probably kick-started uh, that journey a little bit because I'm like, why are my friends' parents dying overseas? Yeah. Uh, for what I didn't understand at the time. And then growing up, yeah, uh, kind of became a liberal, but didn't really get that at the point. Then fell into, I was way too online as a child. I think I'm like the poster child for like, don't give your kids technology. Then I fell into like the Ben Shapiro rabbit hole and like the alt, <laughs> the alt light anti SJW movement. Oh, no, yeah. I was a shoe on head fan at one point. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that. Yeah. Um, she's funny and she's the, the she is funny. I'll give her that, but she's, yeah, She's the uh, people like Armored Skeptic, Thunderfoot, the Amazing Atheist. God, <laughs> this is like this is bringing back memories. Not good ones, but memories. <laughs> um, people like that just fell into like the super reasonable centrist anti SJW stuff. Um, started looking at Ron Paul back in like 2014, probably 2015. Before the 2016 election, I saw some stuff from like the 2012 race. Um, kind of fell in the man trump's not good but like he's not hillary stuff uh started liking the libertarian party though in 2016 with gary gary was mm -hmm. reasonable and i was like man he's not crazy like the rest of these libertarians and i became one of those crazy libertarians eventually uh probably started calling myself an anarchist in 2018 probably became one in 2019 Fair um enough. Okay. I read, uh, you know, For New Liberty and um, mm -hmm. A New Libertarian Manifesto, both by Rothbard. Excellent work still to this day. Jeez, sucks. He's just a bad dude. Um, and then uh, was a Mises Caucus volunteer from like 2018 to 2019. Uh, supported Vermin Supreme during the 2020 primary season and got kicked out of... Uh, volunteering for that and then i got kicked out of the caucus for starting a fight over trans rights with tom woods uh in their facebook group uh because well he, wanted to, he wanted to kick uh trans homeless people out of homeless shelters and their preferred gender identity and i was charming like, yeah I, I was like they just want a bed like <laughs> they just want to sleep somewhere they're not like here to like endanger your children they're not mm -hmm. here to make your kids gay they just want to sleep somewhere out of the cold for one night tom um got kicked out for that never looked back and now i just start fights in the libertarian movement for fun <laughs> all right fair enough um and J jeremy yeah um i started out or i grew up in a um generally conservative household you know fam you know parents were fans of bush but never like highly political mm -hmm. um but but that is kind of the um and kind of what i grew up with um from there um you know when i first started getting a little bit more political was um around the 2008 presidential election um i actually um 
went down to I didn't like attend the um, the RNC um, convention, but I but I went around St. Paul um, mm -hmm. because it was I'm down the road, <laughs> and um, I remember being very excited to see Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> what a time um, that must have been when people were excited to see Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> um, Yep. So he, yeah. So he was out. Um, yeah. I remember being excited to see him um, and then really starting to see some more of the, the candidates, um, you know, quickly, quickly ran into, um, you know, Ron Paul um, and getting to know, um, getting to know him more and, you know, kind of what he was, he was preaching. And I'm like, you know, that actually makes a little bit more sense than, um, you know, what what Rudy or McCain, you know, is, is trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, from there, I was pretty much, um, yeah, I kind of stayed on that right, right leaning, um, the, just like Alec mentioned, the Ben Shapiro, the, you know, the early days of Turning Point USA and, you know, some of that anti-SJW stuff, um, you know, the, the white privilege thing. And, you know, as that stuff kind of started getting out, you know, I, I kind of became a, a bit of a reactionary, a bit of a, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, even contrary and to, to some extent um, and kind of stayed that way for, for quite some time. Um, you know, I remember, um, I remember voting um, for, I think I ultimately ended up voting for, Actually, I don't even remember who I voted for in 2008. Now that I think about it, um, that would have been my first my first presidential election. Um, but then in by 2012, I had voted for Gary Johnson, mm -hmm. um, and then 2016 voted for for Gary once again, um, and then kind of kind of like everybody else with the rise of Trump and you know really seeing um, the the liberty movement. Um, you know, start to go the way of, you know, Cantwell and Hoppe and, um, you know, kind of just this, this element of, um, you know, just racism and sexism and just, just absolutely, you know, it, it all just cranked up so much. And I'm like, no, this just is not right. Um, yeah, I found the Fakertarians group in pr probably 2018 2019 somewhere in there um you know it started getting more involved and you know and what was actually great about that is really talking to a lot of different people with just different views um and really just learning a lot more um and so um so yeah i've just kind of kind of the same drift that the, that the rest of us have have had here um from you know from a political journey um you know, unfortunately, as as you as you learn more, um, you know, especially about people that you know that you can even say brought you into the liberty movement, um, it ends up not being uh, not being what they what they always seem, um, and really learning more about um, you know that that history and the um, like the paleo strategy and and really what that means and even connecting it to what's happening today, um, you know, the, the, the entire paleo strategy never ended. Um, and I think yeah. that, that the rise of populism, the rise of Trump really is the, it's kind of the conclusion, the goal of it. Um, and that's why you see so many um, people that, you know, been involved in liberties really ratchet toward, you know, toward that. Um, and so here, here we are today. You know, the idea that it never ended and this is some sort of conclusion is actually even more ominous than the idea that they did it in the 90s, they failed, and now they're trying again. So that's actually, and I think you might actually be right about that. It's just, it was put on, more on the back burner for a little while. Yeah. And I think um, it wasn't in the party, the Libertarian Party, directly in the same way. Right. Right. I mean, and you see a lot of people that, um, you know, that really just gravitate toward, I mean, the, you know, the bigger players, um, the, you know, the GOP and stuff. And, you know, they, you know, and they, or they see the Libertarian Party as, you know, kind of a joke. And I mean, to many extent it is. Um, but, 
um, yeah, it, it never really, really ended. And, and really you can trace a lot of that back to, um, you know, you look at the, uh, the, the tea party movement in Mm -hmm. 2010, um, Ron Paul, um, and a lot of it started with that and what may have seemed very innocent at first, um, definitely had some, um, it had some elements that ultimately gave us Trump and, you know, and that, that, that rise of the, the liberalism, um, the, the populism that, that is the Republican party, the cult that it is now. Yeah. I always just joke, you don't need to watch a documentary or long form analysis about the Tea Party. Just watch that HBO show, The Newsroom, and they're right about everything. About oh the my Tea God, Party. that show's terrible, though. <laughs> no, first off, Lucy, I've you're never wrong. Seen it. Like, it, they're right about the Tea Party, though. Everything okay, they say is true. Okay, but that clip that goes around Twitter where they're on the oh, plane. Oh, the, the pilot episode? Oh, the plane. That is the most Aaron Sorkin in the pejorative sense thing that has ever been crafted. It's okay. I like Sorkin though, so we'll just agree to disagree on that one. I have a lot of feelings about that clip. I I hate watch two thirds of that show, so I feel yes. no, but that's um... <laughs> someday we'll we'll someday we'll have to debate that again or not. Yeah. Um... Okay, back to a non Sorkin related concept. <laughs> First of all. You all mentioned Ron Paul in a vaguely positive sense. The people that you're trolling on the internet probably love Ron Paul to an insane extent. I guess, like, what? Why are you guys different than them? Especially since you were you were, you're dropping some of the same names. At least you got Rothbard. You got Ron Paul. You've like done the reading and stuff. You were in, you you even took part of the same journey. So like, did you keep going and they stopped? Like, what what is this? I don't think I still look at Ron Paul in a favorable light. I just yeah. think that he was that one catalyst. And it's like, man, he may not be the best person, but he got me where I am today. Whereas mm-hmm. like, Rothbard didn't get me where I am today. So I still don't have that like nostalgic feeling almost. So. I, mean, I don't think I even look back at Ron Paul like in a favorable light. Um, I just think that that's how we got there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think interacting with people like Corey Massimino, um, I know he's a friend of yours, and people from C4SS and engagement with like the individualist uh, mm-hmm. helped a lot more than. And they just engaged with the paleos. They they you know the paleos didn't go away like we said. They just laid the they laid the framework for their uh, eventual takeover because they failed the first time. I mean, they the Mises Institute. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, I mean, like, interacting with groups like John Birch Society and things like that. I mean, they never went away. They just hid. There, even, there were snakes in the grass. So I, I, don't, I don't think that they ever, like, went past Ron Paul, except for maybe in the crazy direction. <laughs> right. I think a big question regarding Ron Paul when someone says uh, that Ron Paul brought them into libertarianism is what part of Ron Paul did they really like? Because for me, it was ending the war on drugs and Mm -hmm. uh, not blowing up people overseas and and things like that. But for other people, it's it's wanting local control so that they could institute Jim Crow laws or something like that. So that's really, it's like, what do you actually like about Ron Paul? And, And for some people, it's more the Hoppe direction where they want kind of, a town or some municipality where everything's controlled and there's some authoritarian figure or there are some really authoritarian rules so that you can control your neighbors and keep out the people that you don't like. And then for others, it's, it's people like, like myself who I think just want individual liberty, human flourishing, tolerance, that kind of thing. I will say that some of the people that I don't care for anymore, certainly they 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 will often cite the 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 war stuff with Ron Paul where he would tend to sound his best especially standing on a stage with neocon war on terror aggressive people and even Ron Paul who was a flailing yinzer who's not like super perfectly spoken managed i think to get across and more and more over the years i know back in like the 80s people didn't like Antiwar.com didn't like him. Like there was clashing. He wasn't libertarian enough. He got more libertarian in a good way, I think, over the years. And he managed to sound, you know, 
decently golden rule caring about your neighbor without sounding like a Hoppeite lunatic. But yet here we are, though, with, you know, him as inspiration. So it, well, it obviously wasn't enough. I remember um, around the time of when the Ron Paul newsletters became like a big story again. I don't know if it was, I forget if it was before, I think it was before the 2012 election where it really uh, heated up again. A lot of myself and a lot of people around me, I mean, we were making excuses for it, which I don't know. I don't think I would make those excuses anymore about the fact like, oh yeah, he didn't do it. It was somebody else. He didn't know that kind of thing. But I feel like some of the people now, um, and, I, and I've seen this said, were like, oh, actually the newsletters were right. So it's, there's people who like him and like Rothbard for the wrong reasons. Like I like some of Rothbard's writing because of the individual liberty aspect, because of the do what you want as, as long as you're not uh, aggressing upon someone thing. But then there's other people that look to people like Rothbard and Lou Rockwell for their nineties writings and are saying, Oh, we need to get the cops out there and smash people's heads in or something like that. Like, uh, Lou Rockwell's LA Times article after the Rodney King riots where he joked about banning video cameras because he said uh, that cops should be able to basically said that cops should be able to beat people up as a deterrent. So it, it really comes down again to what do you actually like about these people and what have you picked out about these people? I think the two most obvious but innocuous phrases people will mention when they're you know going to be red flags is decentralization slash federalism. And the Fed. If someone talks about the Fed more than once in a conversation about libertarianism, <laughs> red flags just in my head. I'm like, you mentioned it once. OK, maybe you're like a, a policy wonk mm-hmm. about monetary policy, but no one actually likes monetary policy. Let's be real. That was the weird thing. The weirdest aspect of the the kids liking Ron Paul thing was like chanting about the Fed like that. That was very strange. Um <laughs> The decentralization thing, yes, I think that that's particularly. Um, I mean, I'm starting. It took me a long, a long time to realize that I think like the Hoppeites. That's I'm just going to fully talk about them in the worst possible light. They like local tyranny. Um, they like religious tyranny. They like family tyranny. And you don't even have to say that. You can fully say the state is the worst offender. Maybe even the federal state is the worst offender. While still not being quite so delighted by those other institutions that are obviously and you know states don't have rights yeah obviously they're they're cheering on texas putting up razor wire at the border when i'm calling on biden to send the 101st airborne and you know (laughs) (laughs) make it make it look like school integration again like you know maybe the fed is maybe the federal government is the worst offender of human rights in american in american life but like sometimes they're right so you know absolutely sometimes they're right um i the real liberty loving thing is to like, what's going to cause more freedom? Like what tool can we use without acting like there's some perfect math, but also during the little, the little rock, uh, 101st airborne, the mayor of little rock actually called the feds because the governor of Arkansas was the one putting up the fight. So you can absolutely interpret that as the local guy being like calling his big bro to come help. So you don't learn that from the, um, Blue Rockwellites, I don't think. Yeah. Right. And well, and that's the thing is, and you, you had said it, you know, what, what is, what produces more liberty? Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, gays can now get married. That was, that wasn't a, you know, universal, you know, option less than 10 years ago. Um, and that's because of the, of the federal government and, you know, how, you know, how the Supreme Court decision came down. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, Minneapolis has gone through some minor reforms and, you know, and, and how they handle things differently, um, you know, especially like from a criminal criminal justice aspect and stuff. Um, you know, that's that's great. Or states legalizing marijuana when it's still, you know, illegal on a federal level. You know, so it's... Yeah, it's just what what does lead to the most liberty, um, regardless of the of the tool that's that's used. That's the right one. <laughs> um, what I do think, and and I think this might be the the biggest issue with really understanding that is just 
a lot of people don't necessarily know how things work. <laughs> how so? Um, you know, and the relationship of, you know, the federal to, you know, to the state governments and, you know, what, what powers states are granted, um, you know, or in what, and, and even just courts too, um, you know, people don't quite understand how a lot of those things work. And because of that misunderstanding um, or lack of understanding, you, you either, your brain either fills in the gaps or, you know, you just, you know, scream whatever you want as far as what your opinion, your opinion is and you're, and you're stuck with it without really learning more about it. Um, and I, I think that that is probably the biggest issue um, when it comes to, um, when it comes to dealing with the, with people in just the everyday world. Um, I, I would love to see a lot more understanding. I've, I've learned a lot in the last few years and that's actually helped change some of my, um, you know, views and opinions. Um, and so that's, that's something that I think should be encouraged, um, in, in, um, political circles and discussions. And, um, I think that would honestly tremendously help a lot. Um, I mean, who knows, are we past that point? now probably um <laughs> but but that's been at least my experience yeah going back to lucy's question because we never really answered it she asked separated us from the people that talk I so like, i forget what it ron was paul. yes you asked us oh. about, about what separates <laughs> us from the people that love ron paul and you know maybe have a picture of him hanging up in their room uh, or like a po or like a old school like guy's room pinup poster of ron paul oh, and yeah. then maybe you gotta uh, it's that we, pass them out yeah it's that we grew up I, th I think Jeremy just said it. We grew up, and th maybe they didn't. Um, yeah, I, I think that I think that is a lot of it. Um, yeah. You know, either either you you know you you can take a few clips of what Ron Paul say you know says here and there, and I think that's probably the, the most knowledge that people have of of him. Um, you know that that do that do like him, um, and for me, you know, I. I I liked Ron Paul up until really just the last few years. And the reason why is because I grew up and I learned more and, <laughs> um, and it, and it actually ties all back in with the paleo strategy and the tea party and the rise mm -hmm. of populism. Um, Ron Paul, just it, as you, as you dig in more, just really never had any good, um, intentions. Um, I don't even know if I agree, but I mean, you can look at what the results more than anything, yeah. you know, he, he knew, he knew how to, he knew how to talk and say things that people liked. Mm -hmm. um, I personally doubt he believed much of the even good things that he, that he says um, or, or said, um, I mean, for the last 15 years, he just rambles the same thing over and over <laughs> again. Um, <laughs> I saw it. Really exciting for a minute there though didn't it? he's successfully <laughs> predicted a hundred of the last three global economic crashes you know? that's 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 what the youtube clips tell me that's true yeah i mean yeah i mean he's he's fairly stale now i mean i know like at the that rage against the war machine rally um yeah. back in last february um which which i actually attended i i had to i had to dip out before ron um showed up but i did end up watching what he said and it's, it's just the same thing over and over and over again but um i really did a uh, deeper dive and actually ended up um doing a podcast episode a faker Tarians podcast episode specifically about the ron paul newsletters mm -hmm. um and you look back at it and it's just it's bad <laughs> it's so bad um yes. just his disdain for anything that is not white supremacy um and and the way that he handled the way that he handled it um you know it's it's one thing if you you know were a terrible person and you know change um, yes redemption but, who doesn't love like a redemption story yep yeah. and 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 that is i think and that's why i have trouble believing you know kind of what what he has said is because of how he handled the newsletters you know mm -hmm. you know it started out with that wasn't me to okay i guess it was me and oh i guess i'm sorry um you know i didn't you know but i still didn't write it well you stamped your name on it 
You know, mm-hmm. either you take responsibility or you don't. And he really never took responsibility for what they said or, um, you know, said that those were wrong at the time. Um, and if you can't do that, I have trouble believing that you're sincere. <laughs> he also never even said sense. those weren't his right? Like, that's my understanding. Like, it's just that we all kind of attribute it to someone else, but he never right. outright said who he's it was. right. Well, that's the thing is it's, 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 it, there's, there's several different, you know, excuses out there. And it's like, no, if you, if you want to give us a story on why, why the newsletters are the way they are and why they're, you know, we're wrong then. And, you know, you're sorry now. Great. You can do that. But he doesn't. And and the and the issue of it was you know it wasn't me it was my intern kind of thing, um, yeah, it pops up more than once for him. <laughs> um, you know that I mean it was it seemed probably what probably 2016 2017 when he posted that super anti-Semitic meme. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Car- uh, it was a Twitter. Yeah. yeah, the mm-hmm. cultural Marxism one. Um, you know, and then and then you look at. Um, who's who's in his circle Mm -hmm. um i think that's what a lot of protecting not refusing like in a very depressing sense of loyalty not throwing people in the circle under the bus i think is part of it yeah um but you look at who is in his circle um uh, dan dan mcadams um you know running running the the ron paul institute Um, what's that one guy benner brenner Dave Benner? Oh, yeah. No, that guy. no, um, his nephew, it's a family member. Are oh, you talking about Benton? Benton. The guy, the guy who's on Benton. the LNC. Or... Oh, that's Dave Benner. Yeah. That piece of I don't shit. know that name, I don't think. What was he, the Nick. Abbeville Institute or something like yeah, that? Yeah, he's some... one of those. He's from one of those neo Confederate institutes, the Abbeville, oh. Aberville, Abbeville. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Aberville Institute, yeah. Um, but, but Benton, you mentioned, mentioned him. Um, I mean, he was funneling Russian money in Dan, Dan McAdams, Daily very, Putin. very tight connections to, to Russia. And, you know, I won't get into all of that unless we, you know, decide to, but, um, you look at who's in the circle and who's really, you know, kind of running things and, it's just it none of it is a good element and that's what you know that's what really just makes me cringe when when i think of ron paul at this point and i think regardless of whether ron paul actually wrote some of the newsletters or if they were all written by someone else he absolutely knew what was going on with like the rothbard rockwell strategy at that time so he he had some idea of what the content was. I mean, it wasn't even just those newsletters. If you look at the newsletter that Rothbard and Rockwell used to put out uh, under their own name, Mm -hmm. that had the article about unleashing the cops. And it had an article by Lou Rockwell, the one complaining about black people in Mighty Ducks 2. And it had, I'll I'll get into that. (laughs) (laughs) You're not familiar with the quack attack? I'm not sure. (laughs) You know, we can, we can get into that one, but it had him complaining about uh, undocumented immigrants having driver's licenses and writing about the real Rosa Parks and stuff like that. So, oh, really? What was wrong with her again? What? Uh, she, it was something about her being a communist, and it was it was all some plot. Whatever. That was Rockwell wrote that in the uh, Rothbard Rockwell report. He was the, always the he's the worst of. Instagram. Oh, I know that that <laughs> Mighty Ducks two article. Um, that's almost as bad of a movie take as uh, Rothbard's take on Star Wars. Star Wars? Wars? <laughs> Star Wars, yeah. Sorry. The Rothbard, yeah, the, the the Rothbard Rockwell report is is full of some gems. I mean, we were we were browsing we through it. And we were yeah. gonna go with the um we were gonna go with the um Rosa Parks one and you know talk about that and literally right before it was the this crazy Mighty Ducks 2 article. <laughs> Lucy, have you seen the Mighty Ducks 2? Or the, even uh, the first one? I slightly recall the first one, but not soup. It's been a long time, so, so I'm it's not a, sure it's I ever a, saw the sequel. It's a Disney kids movie about hockey, right, and the right. second movie introduces an Asian hockey player. Oh, is that political correctness from a Yeah, and it, No, it wasn't political correctness. It was stealing the sport of hockey from white people. 
Yeah, like it but went he went farther than that. The article is called Why Is the Ice Still White? <laughs> <laughs> Which I'll give him credit, is the actually a good expensive? article title. I mean <laughs> That sort of sounds like a tedious academic article, maybe advocating the opposite. But well, you know, hockey is an expensive sport. Like, and no, it's yeah. talking about the anti-white bias and stuff like that, and how there were uh, black kids in South LA that taught uh, that taught the kids how to play hockey better. And he was complaining about the song "Whoop There It Is" being in there. It was, it's <laughs> it's something you got to see that article. Rich, wow. the black kids really teaching them how to play hockey. As a Mighty Ducks fan, the, 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 there's like a good montage of like the black kids teaching them how to play hockey better. And it's about really improving their slap shot. And it's like one of the better sports montages in sports movies. And that's the hill I'll die on. So Rockwell, special place in hell for hating the Mighty Ducks. I have time. the uh, I have the article pulled up on my phone right now. And there's this big square in the middle of it. And it says, or a big rectangle. And it said, it says, movies tell the majority, hate yourself, hate your people. <laughs> oh, that's such a bad because all because he saw all because he saw an, an, an Asian kid playing hockey in a movie like that's <laughs> just, to, just to react that way to seeing something and and it's you still see it you still see yeah. people complaining that you know that the, the dumb commercial showed a gay couple like and, and getting mad about that like and it's just, I mean, so that's the thing. That stuff existed now. It exists today. And I mean, I'm sure it's probably always existed in some form or another and always will exist in some form or another. But when it when it becomes mainstream and a driving force for politics, that's when we slide into this, you know, this liberal populism centered uh, form of form of politics. And unfortunately, we're not very good at calling that out because we just tend to say, oh, well, that's just the other side. It's like, no, your side is bad. You say yeah. bad things and you're bad. And people don't like to call it out because we've we've developed this culture of free speech that has been centered around the First Amendment's version of free speech that, you know, just restricts the government. And, you know, it it's kind of led to this it's partially i think what's what's led to what we what we see today um in the you know gop the libertarian party um as as well and it's like no you you it's okay to call an asshole an asshole for being a <laughs> racist asshole yeah. and you should do it often as possible and you know cuz obviously not platforming somebody or you know allowing them you know a, a space um it causes a different problems but you know i so i i work at home uh i watch cnn all day because it's just something nice to have on in the background um you know that i don't have to pay attention to but i can you know look and and just the way that they treat people with just horrendous views and like they're valid it's like no cnn you are not under the obligation to do that just mm -hmm feel free to actually call them out and you know people people don't do that because of this weird culture of free speech that we have to basically you know like we're all bound to the first amendment as if and, they're not full of opinions on other people's views oh, yeah. and preferences themselves yeah. of course you yeah. need to treat every shithead like they're real and legitimate instead mm -hmm. of saying no you're dumb your arguments are illegitimate i don't like you you don't belong in polite society i mean i've spent like the last three days just bullying racist on twitter and it's been like, yeah. my commitment um, to uh protecting racist is pretty much stops and ends at ruby rich was a little too much you know don't send the feds to kick down the door of racist families yeah that's, uh, yeah. that's pretty much it um, yeah much, yes. i mean I, i've been telling them to follow their leader for the last three days and it's a, a <laughs> mustache man I'm, with, yeah, mustache uh, man. with a hole in his head basically hey he killed hitler as they as the, you know, jokes <laughs> but i i remember too uh even very early on when i first came into the liberty movement um and i think it was in 
regard to certain portions of the Civil Rights Act, because Ron mm-hmm. Paul, um, Ron Paul, and people in the in Ron Paul uh, in the Ron Paul movement were talking about how we didn't need government to regulate racism, basically. And the response to that from libertarians was always uh, that we would do it ourselves, like we'd shun people if we needed to, right, or we right. wouldn't associate with racists. Um, but now that's that's automatically just cancel culture now, and and that's we have to let them, we You're have right. to let the the racists uh, into our circles, and no, we're making too big of a deal of it. I was that's watching true. that. That's a demonstrable, like, that's a demonstrable thing getting worse actually in like the last decade or so. Where I it's was not, watching that. Oh, yeah, the market no, will take ahead. care of the racist is not an argument. I mean, it sounds great on paper, but no, actually, it turns out people actually flock to that <laughs> and support that. that. So uh, Dave Smith Supercut video we have, um, the one that we bought the domain to, Jeremy, <laughs> uh, recently, I was watching that again, and there's this clip he has with Nick Fuentes, and he's mm-hmm. like, you know, if someone were to put up a, a whites-only sign in front of a business, we would be the first to boycott it, right? Yes, Nick? me and Nick Fuentes would both be boycotting <laughs> <Yeah. it. laughs> I was just laughing. So this this clip is like old, but still, we all know who Nick Fuentes is, and it, um, he's becoming even more blatant too. Not that he, what, yeah. if you were an idiot, you might have missed it before, but now. Well, I mean, it's Dave Smith we're talking about. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what it. So, I found a, a post we had made about that clip because I was trying to remember what he thought was the modern day version of whites only signs when what Dave said it was oh, when he was talking with Fuentes. Right. He says that. Being banned from Twitter for calling Caitlyn Jenner Bruce is the modern day version of yeah. whites only signs. Mm, yes, I see that. <laughs> Truly the same they are. <laughs> and of course, every single fan of Dave Smith is is more aggressive and more stupid than he is, and even more <laughs> ideologically crazy. So no, no, I I think. I think it was the interview you did with the guy who goes by Charles Koch on Twitter. Half of Dave Smith's fans are more reasonable and nicer than he is, but they just don't have the good stuff as their line. The okay. other half are stupid and insane. It's but Dave's well. just right in the middle of there, keeping those two groups together. And I think that that's the most accurate way to describe him, actually. He's so fucking overrated, too. <laughs> um, I just This type of conversation just makes me want to just gossip rant about and just drop all these names and just (laughs) i'm going to try slightly not to do that um we can do some of our own gossip if you want (laughs) i mean that's (laughs) that's definitely part of it i guess so to try uh, to try to be as generous as possible in some ways to paleo type things i think that the era when someone like lou rockwell sounded the least insane was the early 2000s -hmm trash and usually trash and george bush were on terror stuff and you know that camp now gets to point to that and look good and say that and then the cato institute published this jerk who thought the iraq war would be swell but i, I don't know like it's a ridiculous thing to to for me to feel like i i, I have been presented with two options i have to be warmongering or hating immigrants, trans people, loving that racism and stuff. Those are your no, options. They're not even anti-war. They're not. Because uh, they... the thing is, they'll, they'll, they'll praise Trump for being anti-war when we stopped reporting civilian drone strike casualties under his watch. He killed. He assassinated Soleimani, which was definitely a gamble, uh, to be generous. The Iran deal just torn right up because it yeah. wasn't his deal. Yeah. Torn it up because it wasn't yeah. his. I mean, his activities and the Middle East and Africa, whereas, you know, Biden isn't perfect, but they're like, Biden is much more of a warmonger than Trump when he ended Afghanistan and also dropped our drone strikes by like 3,000%, something insane. I'm Mm -hmm. not saying he's an anti-war god by any stretch of the means, but when you're praising Trump for being anti-war and Biden is, you know, ending them. I mean, right. And well, and that's the thing is, um, and, you know, specifically Biden um, has, at least um, throughout his vice presidency and stuff, has has kind of always been um, skeptical of of over overusing, um, you know, 
the the power and influence that the U.S. has had um, abroad. I know he was um, fairly fairly against Obama's um, Afghan sur- surge. Um, I don't even remember that far back. So in yeah. terms of that specifically, yeah, for some reason, it, it for some reason Biden and his kind of just wanting to be a little bit more reserved um in the in the foreign policy area just for some reason sticks with me um okay. through throughout all these years but he was he was very much against um the the afghanistan um troop surge that that obama did um and i think too he still seems to you know prefer surgical things um versus you know McCain bomb 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 Iran type type stuff. Oh, and you're dropping a Moab. Oh uh, yes, I forgot about the Moab. <laughs> yeah. And and the you know that's the other thing is is foreign policy and and that's something that you know I've really really started to understand too for the you know the last few years is it's so complicated and a lot of people probably just I can't say shouldn't, you know, have an opinion because everybody is entitled to their opinion. Um, but people should really uh, learn a lot more. You know, <laughs> Once again, me, it's, that un- it's that understanding thing. Um, because a lot of the, because a lot of the anti-war stuff, um, you know, would you know i would say was right for you know regarding iraq and how you know how that happened iraq was bad um and it's very good to be anti-war in that in that kind of sense of you know the imperialism and invasion and and stuff like that um but there's also anti-war as in isolationist and that maybe is is where you know kind of some of the, the confusion and um disconnect or even just bad bad takes come from is that that isolationism um which is supposed to be an insult and supposed to be an unfair one but if you apply it to paleos i think it sort of works 100 percent accurate mm -hmm. yeah i mean they don't even like trade very much they certainly don't want to let in people who many of whom are direct victims of america's wars because oops that was before we're start, starting yeah. now. Not our fault. I mean, I don't, I don't right. know if you've seen some of the current immigration bill proposals from the GOP, but one of them would end and suspend the parole, uh, immigration parole program, which is how we get people, you know, from Afghanistan who were helping us in the war. And I mean, like, man, you are going to like, anyways. Yeah, uh, I, I got one last thought on Jeremy's thing. I mean, my family came from what was Yugoslavia. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were, were Macedonians, so thankfully we avoided the civil war, but like, Whenever I hear libertarians talk about like stopping the Yugoslavian genocide, I'm like, yeah, civilians died from our bombings, but like, let's not pretend that we prevented a magnitude larger amount of civilian deaths from you know ethnic cleansing and genocide. And and that's what irks me. You're like, maybe you can make the argument that like it should have been Europe's responsibility, but um, they like to pretend that we're like mass murdering war pigs for like accidentally bombing some serbian civilian encampments or populations when you know that's jeremy's thing there's just uh paleos don't like nuance mm-hmm. uh yeah. and lucy maybe you have a different opinion than me on yugoslavia but i think you and i both at least come from nuance uh, I, mean, I think that's the difference between us and them i don't uh, yeah I, I would uh, it's one of the many things i would totally veer a soft course and ask follow-up questions about because I thought earlier in that war, the U.S. wasn't doing much at all. And the whole the whole trauma of like Sarajevo for the West was like having to sit there and like watch it happen and not and the U.N. being feckless and yeah, all that. There was Yugoslavia one and Yugoslavia two is what I always like to say. And we got involved in Yugoslavia two. So like 98, 99 more. Yeah. Like Kosovo and. Yeah, we like the, we put U.N. troops in, in between the Serbian troops in the Kosovo population and we're like hey if i ever you want to fire at us go ahead but like we we will and you know it's like that uh old maddest video where he's like you know if you want to make war with the united states of america send someone else to raise your sons and daughters like that was basically what we told them yeah that's one of those things on the cusp of i actually remember that but also know nothing because i was like 11 so what do yeah. i know about so i 
I should have to check on that one. And you know, uh, speaking of globalization and uh, tolerance, uh, Macedonia just elected an Albanian as prime minister. So, huh. like, uh, you know, maybe things are turning out for the better for the rest of the world, even though we're arguing about racist on the internet. Yes. We are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is literally their Obama moment. Um, I'm not even joking. I mean, mm-hmm. the racial animus between Macedonians and Albanians is very high. Very, very high. I got a sense for a while there that people were waiting for a sequel to that war to break out as well. About um, six months ago, yeah. The, there was a lot of troop movement um, and like pot shots. And uh, I don't think any civilian deaths, but there was conflict for sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I would say that I'm overridingly anti-war and as pacifistic as possible. But I've said before, if you if you get down to it too far, you could start condemning like the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising because like yeah. the Wehrmacht was drafted and you know they're quasi a victim of Nazi Germany as well. Therefore, it's somehow wrong. Like, and, like no, like you would start to get absolutely insane. Right. And it's not quite as severe, say Ukraine being invaded by Russia, but there's still an element of do you not understand that those are people with their own wills and opinions who like every other population is reacting negatively to being invaded and that if nothing else, don't they have a reasonable cause? Yeah. I'll, I'll argue with people on like what proper support for Ukraine looks like. And I kind of take the more liberal stance on, you know, we have, we're going to pay a shit ton of money to maintain our old equipment. Why not send it over? That's what my husband is always on. The um, <laughs> And I'll, I'll have that debate with people who are like, maybe America shouldn't get involved. But when I hear people say Ukraine should just roll over, I mean, why are they fighting? I'm like, go, like, you know, your favorite I mean, movie is Red Dawn. Like, maybe they should, like, in this, in the really brutally practical sense, maybe all populations facing sure. anything should roll over. Um, you could even advocate for that. But full on Putin defending, which <laughs> I'm going to. F- just say that Daniel McAdams, by the way, is <laughs> Putin. Daily Putin was that what he said? <laughs> out of his mind, um, right. and it's like <laughs> not even face- he Like he's saying it like it's facetious, and yet he truly is pro Putin, and he's he loves the LGBT crackdown. Yeah, I like to joke that. Okay, the last clip I ever saw of like the Ron Paul web show where it's Ron Paul and Daniel McAdams, they were talking about Chelsea Manning. When she was released from prison before she got sent back for the fucking jury stuff later but um they like gender her correctly they're very polite they're like slightly confused old men but they're very polite about it which is saying she's a hero they're saying she and i was like okay and then they died like nothing they did after that like because that would have been one to go out on where their reputations would be slightly okay um <laughs> But, you know, a- a- every single thing since then has been a, a nightmare. So, yeah. I mean, and Daniel McAdams literally ran a website called The Daily Putin. Yes. I mean, based <laughs> and, on the evidence that I believe you guys have dug into, I have seen. Yeah. Yeah. And now Tucker Carlson's in Russia okay. going to interview Putin. And, uh, you know, who was that one like 60 minutes reporter that would like interview all those dictators? I can't remember her name now, like all over like the Middle East. Yeah. Oh, I... She didn't, you know, love them and like, you know, worship them. And, you know, Putin's going to ask them questions, ask or Tucker's going to ask Putin questions. Like, why do the Ukrainians hate you? You're such a nice guy. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's not a journalist. Um, no. Right. I mean, he's a, he is a, he's a propagandist and, I, I mean, and that's the thing is, right, you can you can interview you can and and that that discussion actually kind of comes up every so often, um, you know, with with us. And, you know, you can you can interview somebody, you can have somebody on that you vehemently dis- disagree with in you yeah. know, many ways. Um, and you can have a conversation about your disagreements. Um, but you, you can't just have them on agree with everything they say say we're fellow travelers and you know call it a day and you know say oh they were having a discussion no you weren't yeah no 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 you weren't you were you're 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 planting seeds you're you know you're leading people on um and and that's always been 
you know, once again, it's it you're you're taking something that is bad, nefarious, which is basically platforming somebody agreeing with everything they you know a terrible person agreeing with everything they they say um and you know calling that a conversation versus you know ch- challenging them asking them questions really you know that's that's good um but most yeah, like, people are bad at it even people that are better intentioned um yep i think that balance is not easy i I have interviewed a couple of horrible people and I had a great time, but in general, if it's, you know, my own podcast, if you were all Putin or even like, um, I don't know if I, like, like Joe Arpaio, who I interviewed once, who's a horrible, horrible person. Yeah, I forgot about like, him. What, like, what is the, like, what is the line of having a guest on your show? Um, it, when Dave Smith I- interviewed uh, Nick Fuentes, that was Dave Smith's show, was it not? Yeah, where he's it was part of the problem. A fellow traveler, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's been on twice. There is a a subjective line, but you know, once you reach that point with the sucking up, it's pretty clear that something has gone too far. Yeah, so like if if Dave had brought Fuentes on and had really like challenged him on some of the those ethno nationalist views instead of tipping his hat to him for triggering the right people. Like he said, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really have a problem with that. No, I mean, yeah. we brought on Jeremy Kaufman onto our show once and we got him to admit that he thought that states and municipalities should be able to enforce Jim Crow laws. So yeah, I, I saw right. some, no, I know. So I already I, didn't like him, um, but <laughs> a little surprised. So. Yeah. So I, I do see value in bringing people on and actually challenging them on some of their, uh, for lack of a better term, bad views. Uh, but it's not just bringing them on and saying you agree with them on the on the war machine or whatever, like Dave did with Fuentes. But mm-hmm. with Fuentes, it's because he thinks the Jews control everything. So it's, it's not, Fuentes isn't like, oh, I care about all these civilians and I don't want to see civilians get massacred. He just says, he. I mean, I'm sure Fuentes would be okay with massacring civilians if he thought it was an America first position. He periodically advocates for it in because he wants a Catholic theocracy. I mean, right. at this point, he he has just been suggesting like a war uh, for that end. The idea that he is a humanitarian or that those type of people again, not to be too nice to Ron Paul, but at least. Um, he managed to sound like he cared in a right. vaguely Christian yeah. in the positive sense way about the poor people and the bombing. Like he managed to at least sound like a halfway convincing old grandpa in that way. And um, I think he did to an extent. I, I mean, maybe, I even if he had like, it. even if he had racist tendencies, I don't think his tendencies of racism are like, I think they should die. Um, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> to, to, just to be frank, yes. I guess. And I think, I think that line you asked about is just what legitimacy you lend Mm -hmm. i mean you can invite someone on your show and just berate them for an hour and just which would also be a bad interview i mean i mean it would be a bad interview (laughs) and i don't think it's like worthful i don't think it's like worthwhile doing but like Mm -hmm. it it doesn't give them legitimacy and i mean i don't know how on twitter you are but like will stancil has is going to posters valhalla he's like this generic kind of left liberal progressive guy Mm. and will fight with anyone about anything and has spent like the last week just bullying race scientists um (laughs) like people like steve sailor and his little hobgoblin minions and he's just like what do you think like globalization meant like just kind of he just he, he he calls them like hobgoblins and evil people and he spent like he's got a considerably larger following than all of them and he's technically platforming them but he's saying like you don't belong in polite society go back to like go back to your cave go back to where I, you I, came I, from yeah <laughs> I, 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 I think that's died. just the line and, and it's like what kind of asshole are they are they just like an asshole kind of a person yeah you don't you can platform them whatever are they like this gross evil bigot like just say you don't belong in polite society and call it a day um yeah, I think that's my line. It's just a, it's a, it's a question of, uh, you know, degree. I mean, and then I still fall back to my old, okay, you know, George W. Bush was very polite and um, wasn't even as anti, it seems downright pro-immigrant compared to the current GOP, but George W. Bush and, you know, say Dick Cheney are offensive to... <laughs> My evil people just you yeah. know <laughs> re- replace bigot with evil and but I, that just I, you know. 
translates to, and that's why you have to pick the racists who claim to be isolationists, but you actually can't trust them because the Nazis were, of course, famously isolationist and stayed <laughs> well between. <laughs> I mean, like, why would you, why would you trust that? Um, yeah. I always but, get skeptical when, when people talk about, uh, as in regard to foreign policy, when what they lead with is America first, instead of like worrying about civilian casualties because i think america first can kind of take a turn to actually this would actually help america if we had some casualties over here it's not really like a principled stand as much as it's a more more coming from a selfish position than from uh than from actually caring about other people that is a rhetorical decline from again like the 2012 last hurrah of Ron Paul era. Like it actually is more blatantly worse sounding. Yeah, they, um, they used to say things like globalization, not globalism. And that's, you know, a perfectly fine phrase. And now they're saying like, you know, America first, like John just said. Yeah, because no. that worked out really which, well. Which I mean, the, the which is an idea that's been out there for, you know, a long time. 90 years. Look at. 100 years. <laughs> Charles Lindbergh, damn you. Yeah, none of that. <laughs> I mean, none of that worked out very well. Who was that uh, Louisiana priest, um, the really anti-Semitic one back in like the New Deal? He was big American Father first. Coughlin? Yeah, Coughlin. Oh, there we yeah. go. The radio yeah. priest. Yeah, those those shitheads. Um, I wanted to jump off of you talking about the the glorious uh, posters Valhalla thing. Um, <laughs> you guys are kind of shit posters you guys troll thank you harass (laughs) (laughs) i guess first of all like i don't know like what do you like what are you what do you think you're doing with that sort of tactic and what do you think it's accomplished so far sometimes i'm just bored (laughs) (laughs) no i mean i think we're exposing certain elements in the liberty movement Um, Mm -hmm. bringing them to the surface so that people can see what their motivations actually are. And I do see some power in, I mean, obviously there's power in debating people and arguing with them and going over logic, but I do also see some power in just ridiculing people Mm -hmm. um, who deserve to be ridiculed, just kind of taking them down a notch so that people don't support them and don't rally behind them. I do see some power in that. And I mean, even when we're going after people, like we're not just making random things up. I'm always very, uh, very, very careful about fact checking things. I won't say something unless I really think I have something to back it, even if it's something that I can't uh, expand upon publicly, like a private source or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I do think as far as the Libertarian Party goes, uh, to be specific, the Mises caucus did obviously take over, but I think a lot of what we've done and what other people have done in going after the Mises caucus has brought those issues to the forefront and limited the size of how big they can actually grow. Like, yeah, they can bring in like the alt-right ship posters and the Hoppians and stuff like that. But a lot of the, what I would call more normal libertarians, whether they be, uh, minarchists, whether they be anarchists, radicals, moderates, anything, they can see a lot of the issues with the Mises caucus because us and other people have drawn attention to them. And it just caps how much the Mises caucus can do to to what we're seeing right now, where membership is in decline, donations are in decline. We have the uh, Libertarian Party chairwoman even saying behind the scenes that that the Mises caucus takeover was a failure. That was a few months ago. So I think we can see the results of that right now in how the party is just absolutely falling apart. Though, would they not be falling apart without your help as well? Because. Oh, it would be a dumpster fire. I think there's just value in chronicalization as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, History is sometimes told through shit posting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they do, you know, Mises caucus does have, I mean, they, they just do have kind of a, a hard limit on, um, you know, the, the size that they can, that they can grow because I mean, you know, even without us putting it out there, you know, in, in the, in the forefront, um, you know, you're, you're going to still get people that are be like, nope, that's, that's too far. That's too much. Nope. I'm not, you know, I'm, you know, count me out. Um, but, you know, plus 
they're just i don't i don't know if there's really a good way to say it besides a lot of dumb people in charge (laughs) just (laughs) just people that once again it's it's that how things work stuff um and you know the the liberal the illiberals um you know the populist type just don't really know how things work um you know and they they not always and you know that is a generalization but you you see how the party you know operates you know how it used to operate versus how it does now and you can just tell how clueless they they really they really are um despite despite their their um promises to you know make everything well f- functional and not embarrassing um in, in the a... words of the chair and uh-huh. everything they do Neither you know they just yeah, everything they do uh, um it, is either just so ridiculous on the you know on its on its face or you know they don't really just know how to do anything so it was always it was always doomed to fail for a multitude of reasons but maybe i'm a dirty practicalist jeremy if i can intervene but when they complain about the corruption of nick sarwark and joe bishop henchman and i'm saying this as someone who can't stand nick personally um he and i have like a personal issue i'm not gonna like get into and maybe he does maybe he doesn't have an issue with me but i have an issue with him um we can but, edit that out or not your no no I don't, I, no he knows i've been he knows i've been with him um I've, I've made that clear and i actually like his wife and i, I like his circle i just don't like him and that's okay. um i don't think i've met him in real life so. when, when they complain about like the the corruption of those two I'm like man it just sounds like they were effective leaders of a national political party like i mean right. sometimes things are corrupted but we have to clear out the corruption is a very old very convenient excuse for getting people out and your people in yeah um, Especially since yeah. they're in executive session behind closed doors okay. much more often than Nick's and Joe's LNC were, and they're hiding things. Uh, I mean, Angela hired her boyfriend uh, and father Angela of her child without telling the board. And uh, I mean, Austin Paget is his name, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, how, he gets paid. Chief fundraiser. Party. Um, and she didn't tell the board. <laughs> <laughs> at first and uh the Mises people are really bad at filing FEC reports is what I'll end on I mean I would be too there's a reason I don't stage party coups um <laughs> you my know. hatred of immigrants and kindness is not my overriding motivation so um <laughs> I don't know based based on what, what Jeremy was saying though I mean um we talked about the paleo thing was always there but it was certainly in the background I mean did is part of it just that they saw Trump and his ridiculous naked ego and basically making being an unrepentant asshole the fashion? I mean, did they see that and think why we can do this too? So even if Gary Johnson, you know, was the was the peak Libertarian Party results, do they think they can do the same thing as the Republicans have done with Trump? Because that's kind of that's kind of what I see. Um, like they maybe think they can actually get somewhere sincerely and they're not just. I mean, I think that was the, I think that was the idea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, um, you yeah, know, Trump, Trump definitely, I think kind of enabled that kind of discourse. Um, and for some reason they thought, and this was, I mean, basically another reason why they're kind of doomed to fail is they're, they're trying to, in many ways copy something that's already there yeah and so seems that way well if you already got something that's already there and you know a hell of a lot more effective um then why why even why even bothers you know switching supporting you know becoming involved in you know the the libertarian party when you can just vote for trump and you know and and support the the gop machine so yeah is Trump a paleo, by the way? Because, uh, I mean, uh, like everyone else, I don't expect him to have been reading up on the 90s strategy. But... I refuse to define Trump. <laughs> I, I, I just think it's a losing it's... battle to try and define I mean, Trump as yeah, anything. That's, that's... It, it, well, I mean, he. I don't think he is a paleo. And yeah, it's, it's hard to define. I mean, it really is hard to define the political 
you know leanings of a of a of a populist movement because Mm -hmm. it really isn't isn't about principles (laughs) in the first place whereas i think you know paleo a paleo is going to have principles um you know whether they're good or bad or misguided or whatever they're still going to have them you know lou rockwell absolutely a a, a paleo um, a man of great principle <laughs> a man of principles <laughs> of, of he sure has them they're all bad but but he has them mm. um whereas whereas you know trump and um and you know maybe that's that is one one thing that is slightly more defining about um you know what what the mises caucus and you know the current lp is is, is there are still some principles there um but you you see that kind of even now just you know changing depending on um you know kind of the kind of the mood um i mean i mean look there the who knows at this point but rfk could potentially become the nominee that there's a non-zero chance of that happening and the fact that that's happening especially Mm. for you know especially for people that that claim to be so principled is just i mean it's ridiculous but get ready for diphtheria whooping cough polio it's all coming back (laughs) well libertarianism is about not taking vaccines and deporting immigrants i've heard that that is is how we uh, the libertarians lost penn Gillette, by the way um, yeah. At least that's the way he told it recently. Is that right. he got an email about we had to all burn masks in a rally, <laughs> and he was like, you know what, I'm done. I was like, yeah, okay, we, <laughs> great. We you lost our, our, our guy who seemed pretty well meaning and was all about critiquing, you know, shit like homeopathy and other wacky stuff. Um, and we lost him because you people are out of your minds. Speaking yeah. of uh, RFK. Well, uh, I'd like to direct people, if I can shamelessly self-promote, to KennedySmith24.com and KennedySmith2024.com. There is a great video it links to, which is a Dave Smith supercut. Oh, no. <laughs> did you do was, that the other day? Uh, yeah, Jeremy and I did that. Uh, <laughs> and what, what did you told? Super... <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, we did. We um, just, uh, just, yeah. Yep, about a couple, about a couple websites, just in case things happen. Because there was a there was a rumor about RFK asking Dave Smith to be his VP nominee. Oh, I, don't know. I checked. Yeah, I checked the part of the problem episode with RFK's transcript. The offer was made partly as a joke, partly serious. What does that even mean? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's uh, like it, kind it, of it's funny. Like a joke, but legitimately right. enough to be it's, framed as like, can this happen? Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, haha, ha, JK, comma, unless. <laughs> unless yes. I mean, I, I didn't know vaccine denial was more important than gun rights to the liberty movement, but uh, oh, yeah. I guess Well, I mean, look look at our chair right now, or the, I won't say R because I'm not a member anymore, but the Libertarian Party's chair, she went on Tim Pool and started talking about German new medicine, which obviously we which don't have to get to too look far up. into that. But, um, yeah. <laughs> that is anti-semitic conspiracy yeah theory? it's basically the jews are giving your kids cancer um you don't say to, to do white genocide <laughs> which she said that and wasn't immediately discredited by everyone who has ever met her apparently and yep. i mean <laughs> no they just let that kind of just roll right off and i mean she even knew what she was saying was more or less stupid and embarrassing by the way that she um you know kind of just rolled that off of her tongue but i mean yeah that's seems to be what she believes so <laughs> i mean before covid i don't even have a good sense of what kind of anti-vaccine movements there were in libertarianism i mean there was the association mostly with really pejorative hippies i think but now it's just this moot that's this union of crunchy and right wing and the libertarians are embracing it as well and yeah see i grew up in white suburbia so i was very familiar with like vaccine denial and like anti-science bullshit well but... you were around, i mean you're younger you were around when um and i don't, i think the liberal media kind of wants us to forget that there was a couple years in the early 2000s where they were giving a lot more credence 
to the autism yeah. vaccine connection. Oh thing. yeah. Um, oh yeah. There was a Robert Kennedy article that ran in Salon and Rolling Stone that were eventually fully pulled that tried to make this grand connection. It was Jenny McCarthy was being yeah. <laughs> listened to kind no. of, I mean, <laughs> it was a very weird time. And I, I do wish that the media would admit I mean, would just remind, like, yeah, we know that that was a blunder, you know, like the right. satanic panic or something. Like we were a little too uh, credulous back then. Um, yeah, but they don't I mean, the thing is, yeah, RFK, yeah, and, and I remember, yeah, specifically Jenny McCarthy too, who I believe has pretty much said my bad about everything after um, writing like nine books about it and being you're right. <laughs> the face of it. Wonder she's still selling them. Yeah. And as someone who developed asthma because of long COVID, I'm just really glad vaccine denial is still super delightful. Yeah. yeah, I uh, yeah. I had like pre asthma, really bad al- allergies, and then uh, got COVID, and then got asthma. So you know, yeah. Well, a lot of the the Mises Caucus people make being against the COVID vaccine like one of their main issues. Like I don't know if you guys saw at the libertarian party of georgia debate uh clint russell that liberty Lockpod guy was apparently asking all the uh asking all the presidential candidates if they had taken the vaccine to like try to shame them on it i, I know jacob hornberger actually made a video pushing back on that i was talking to but Corey it was, it was this. it's this whole okay. thing where mm-hmm. that's like a top three issue for them and even like a personal thing not like do you endorse you know, various right. excessive measures. Did you take it personally? That's yeah. insane that they were asking. That. Oh, I know. Yeah. Cause and... there, he was saying that if you take, I think his, uh, his thinking was that if you take the vaccine, it means you overly trust government or something like that. And you can't be trusted to be the libertarian party nominee. If I and... knew all these people trusted sort of the classic, vaccines then i would give them a tiny bit more credence but it's like oh it's not even a, a regular vaccine it's this new scary thing well do you like regular vaccines no i don't i don't take i mean vaccine. we're getting like measles and mumps outbreaks in like pennsylvania now sorry to say lucy like Thank, oh, great i'm looking forward to it <laughs> i saw stuff about um more vaccine reluctance in pet owners with rabies and i quit the human race after that and what really pisses, what really pisses me off is that like we're developing new vaccines and new like preventative procedures using mrna like as a science um yeah. I, I forget there's been like uh there's been some new developments in preventing certain like immune diseases with mrna i forget which ones yeah. autoimmune disorders i mean mm-hmm. and it's like oh can't have those anymore because one half the country will never take an MR, mRNA vaccine again, basically. Right. Um, Alzheimer's um, is another is another one that will will event I think will eventually come, um, and that's that's through mRNA. Um, so yeah, I mean that's the thing is, and well, I mean we've got there's an RSV one um, mm-hmm. now. Um, I mean that's the thing is once once this is kind of spinning you know now that it's going um and and really i mean because that's the thing is it's been around for a long time the you know the 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 study and trial and you know trying to do something and just i mean covid was kind of that that's that scientific push to um get something and really figure it out nail it down um you know even if it isn't perfect um or you know totally a hundred percent um effective it's still you know good good management of risk and it sure seemed that way huh yeah one and, of the modern and, age's greatest ironies is that it was trump and warp speed because you see like the people like marjorie taylor green who can't stop sharing he's so conflicted because he wants to brag about that oh yeah absolutely fully because all of his people think that was his greatest error i remember right. watching this interview Fox News, and he basically said he couldn't take credit for it because his supporters would stop liking him. Sometimes I think you got that booed. real talk from him. That's exactly yeah. what it is. But I'm like, it's his. It's one of the modern age's greatest ironies mm-hmm. because, like, you got like the CNN people and like Kamala Harris saying they wouldn't trust a Trump vaccine. Yeah, and then you got like the Marjorie Taylor Greens who now share V Dare inform like V Dare stats about vaccine injuries and deaths, and it's all bullshit. But they're like, uh, like oh man, Trump gave us Operation Warp Speed, and I'm like, I love Operation Warp Speed. <laughs> we 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 derail the fuck out of like the medical like 
global industry and we're like, let's just get a vaccine and like, let's do a little bit of studying, but like, let's get it out first. Remember yeah. when libertarians used to complain about the FDA taking too long? And right. That right. Now they vanished. It just, it, it did. It, it, it was, I mean, COVID was a brain breaking event for <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Truly. Yep. Yes. <laughs> And, and, and wearing a mask in Walmart mistakes. was the worst tyranny in our lifetime. What, what about, what was the worst tyranny? <laughs> wearing a wearing, mask in Walmart. Oh, no, I was just saying oh, that wearing yeah. a mask in Walmart was the worst tyranny in our lifetime. And if they could pick joking. and choose, again, any kind of, okay, the worst examples where somebody gets, you know, tackled by a cop for not wearing a mask in a park. Like, there's all, you can find ridiculous yeah. examples, of course. Like, the people who are surfing and, like, get, like, cited <laughs> with, like, the mask warnings yeah. because, like, they're insane. not thousands of feet away from people. Many mistakes were made. Absolutely. I totally agree. The idea that it was the biggest tyranny in American history makes me think you're just the whiniest person on God's earth. And, again, where like, Walmart politely requested I wear a mask, and that is the same as everything else. I mean, it's uh, yes. property rights. Unless I disagree with the property owner. Uh, oh yeah, you have another one where it's oh, no. I'm... Yeah, yeah. It just yep. Yeah, it 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 did it 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 broke a lot of people. The Trump started the brain breaking, and then COVID kind of finished it. Or some yeah. people credited it to like mm-hmm. GamerGate, and like just on the cusp of everyone calling everyone an SJW for you know, years straight. As as someone who went down that rabbit hole as a as a preteen and teenager, I absolutely maybe give GamerGate an out uh, an over exaggerated amount of credence for the credit I it wonder. deserves. Because 4chan is the most powerful website that a lot of us have never been to. And the amount of internet that it created, and if Trump is the internet troll created president, then, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe they actually do get a lot of credit, which is yeah. still baffling that that could happen. But since I grew up a, a right-wing internet troll, that, I, I think that's <laughs> what Confession. separates me from some of the more anti-racist people i grew up a right-wing internet troll so i have the patience of one i will keep like <laughs> telling racists to follow their leader and like make jokes about you know fucking their mom and how uh they get the cock chair in the hotel room um <laughs> a noble a truly noble calling that you follow yeah i mean like i'll just do it during class when i'm bored and uh i'll, I'll spend hours with, like i have all the time in the world and you're probably uh unemployed so like you know <laughs> I guess we didn't fully explore, again, like, what have you seen, I guess another example that we were talking about um, before we started uh, recording was when LouRockwell.com linked to the Daily Stormer website, which is a blatantly Mm -hmm. no deniability possible Nazi website, and I forget what the article was about, it was not about direct Nazi things, but it was... It was, um, it was about oh, there, were, yeah. there were some was, i'm gonna pull it up I, yeah, was it about was mm. it an article about replace was it replacement theory i thought it was more no, like it was, you know, economics or something asinine but from not oh no, no it, it, was, it, was, it was about a bunch shit. of different things yeah there was complaining about interracial marriage and like gay sex being legalized and I mean, there were like a few libertarian ish, vaguely libertarian issues <laughs> thrown in from what I remember, but there was a whole list of things. And a lot of them were like straight up Nazi things. I'm trying to see if I can find it. Yeah, I mean, the Daily Stormer is one of those things that you shouldn't link to directly and you shouldn't endorse. And that is a great line to have. It's a pretty generous line. Um, and... They, uh, whoever does the actual blogging over there, they deleted that link. And I recently saw people responding to a Fagritarian's account saying that this must be photoshopped, your screenshot of this Lou Rockwell Daily Stormer link. And it wasn't because you're trustworthy and because I saw it when it happened. But there are people out there who don't believe you, even when you're offering evidence and deep dives. And I, I think some of those people are salvageable, but... They have this knee-jerk aversion to you guys, and I don't know. I think 99% of people are salvageable, and maybe that's just because I went to a I Catholic like university, even though I'm not <laughs> Catholic. Um, do I believe that everyone's worth the time investing to salvage? No. 
Um, yeah. Sometimes people just find their own way there, though, and they're they're salvageable. Uh, but I've seen people deny it when they're handed a Wayback Machine link to yeah. the post. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, maybe you can say I, we Photoshopped a screenshot, and I don't know how to do that because I'm technologically illiterate. Mm. But uh, I'm, I'm sure some people do. But um, I've seen people deny Wayback Machine links, and I'm just like, I don't know what to tell those people. Or I usually tell them nothing or make fun of them uh, to their face. Um, so the article was called What the U.S. Government Has Done to Normal People. That's what and it was. I have a little... Yeah, and I have it says here's a list of the things that the U.S. government has done to normal people. Some of them are uh, flooded us with primitive third world savages, Charming. declared white people, and then in parentheses Native American population to be terrorists, promoted black riots and violence, forced racial integration, legalized gay anal sex, legalized interracial marriage, gave women the right to vote gave homosexuals direct access to children and legalized pornography. Those are just a few of the the things in there. So that was linked to from Rockwell site. And it was a longer article. Like there were some other paragraphs in it after that, but how it many was, of those things would has Lou Rockwell do, got come directly like argued though? Like how many of those things have they basically said on their own website? But, so um, they've, they've posted about white genocide on their own website before. I've definitely seen that. Um, I have seen a lot of anti-immigration stuff. I don't remember if I've seen uh, complaining about women having the right to vote, but I've definitely seen that from some Mises I've, people. I've encountered that halfway facetious but not really thing at actual libertarian gatherings, at a fee gathering that I went to. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's a weird spot to see that one. Yeah, that was a... Mm, there's some dubious people at that one. Um, oh, very, there's like, dubious people everywhere. I'm, just... I'm, it was very proto Trumpy and like, oh, I'm keeping it real, you know, <laughs> to, to tell the truth. As far as what you were saying earlier about how people, it, I do get the sense that a lot of people just don't trust what we post. Yeah. Um, and I'll ask them sometimes, like actually trying to have a good faith conversation. Like, can you tell me something we've posted that, like which just wasn't was blatantly not true or something like that. Demonstrably false. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a, but and they'll just say, oh, you call you say Dave Smith is like pandering to racists and stuff. And it's like, well, but the, I, I can't, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was like a time we posted a link to something and then like corrected it when we found out it was wrong. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but that happens to everyone. But I, I can't I know, think I, of any, yeah. of any I like huge thing. thing. Yeah. yeah I can't like, think of any like huge thing where it's just been like, oh, we were blatantly lying about something. I mean, part of it, um, I wish I had the tweet in front of me, but it was on the official Libertarian Party account right after the Mises Caucus takeover. You're not blocked yet? Um, I'm I'm blocked by the Mises Caucus account because that's how much bridge building. Okay, that's rookie doing. numbers, but not blocked by the National Party yet. Last, last I checked. <laughs> Try harder. Uh, Maybe after this podcast you will be. I'm sorry. Um... <laughs> But it was like, you know, this is now the party of Ron Paul again. And it shouted out him. Rockwell. Rockwell. Rothbard. Rothbard. was I don't remember. I hope, and I Tom Hoppa, Woods, I think. I hope Hoppe wasn't actually on there. Um, yeah, I think it was Tom Woods was the last one. <laughs> but just like this cult mentality. And the Ron Paul thing is the most obvious example. But... There is, it's a cult of personality, a handful of personality. They are all very similar demographics. They are all white dudes. Um, most of them are really old. Most of them are, you know, some of them are dead. Some of them are out of favor. And I wonder if some of it comes down to you're skewering their people and, or including someone like Dave Smith who has their own fans. Like They're, that's what yeah. it comes down to sometimes. You're going after my guy. So you're back. There's a big... There's a big hero worship because I, we haven't even really gotten into it, but I was part of the Mises Caucus for a couple of years um, mm -hmm. in like 2018, 2019. I mean, and weren't you I, like managing Josh Smith's campaign for- I was Chandler helping with it, yeah. I, wasn't, I wouldn't say I was helping. managing it, but I was, I was definitely big behind the scenes there in 2018 um, because a big part of my interest in the Mises Caucus originally was to, to go on a little bit of a tangent- was I was pretty disappointed in the Johnson Weld ticket, specifically Bill Weld, because I couldn't sure. stand Bill Weld. Totally fair. I didn't think he was a libertarian. <laughs> and then these people come in and say, oh, we're going to be principled and stuff like that. 
And I saw them initially, the, when it first started, the like hardcore alt-right people tried to join. And I was keeping an eye on it for, for fakertarians. And they did kick out like the most egregious examples. So then I was thinking, okay, maybe this isn't going to be so bad. Maybe I can do some good here. Maybe they're really not going to be some kind of alt-right thing. But it's the more it's the more people who don't say the quiet part out loud that was kind of getting amplified a little bit more in the caucus and that's what that's what ultimately got me out of it but i wrote an article when i left um about how besides just the issues with bigotry and sacrificing libertarian principles when it comes to things like immigration another one of their big things is hero worship because Mm -hmm. a big blow up i had in there after i had already left the because i was like a moderator for their facebook group or whatever same. So after I had already stepped down from that, um, I had kind of a back and forth with Dave Smith over him propping up Stefan Molyneux and talking about how great he is and stuff like that. So that's what got everyone to turn on me because they see like they're the, the big guys like Rockwell and Ron Paul and Dave Smith as pretty much infallible. And if you do anything to really try to challenge them, I mean, that that facade is kind of broken down a little bit recently because they're all mad at Dave Smith for not running. Okay. But but for a while, it was if you did anything to challenge them, you were like an apostate. Mm -hmm. And I did I did actually find the tweet you were talking about. Um, It was it was from like a week after they took over and it said the Libertarian Party is now a home for Ron Paul supporters. We welcome you with open arms. We represent the tradition of Mises and Rothbard and are eternally grateful to Lou Rockwell, Jeff Deist, and everyone at Mises for keeping their legacy alive. Everyone, especially our pal Gary N. I don't remember if he was dead by then. No, he was still... I'm sorry I missed when he died. I I forgot about him. Who died? I I missed the man. Gary Gary North. North. Oh, Gary North. Sorry, I missed that. This is another example of just no principle actually exists. Because oh, when they gave him a life, Mises Institute gave him like a lifetime achievement award or something like that. And he's over here talking about like stoning gays and stoning gay people and oh, and disobedient children. Oh yeah, yeah. full on Old Testament. <laughs> Gotta stone them. Man. Oh man. Some yeah, things are beyond it, the pale, and that's Gary North is one of them. But like, yeah, that's he, the, that's a, just this a one note list of people. Um, yeah. Well, and Gary North was the only person Tom Woods would pay to read. I remember that. Yeah, Tom did say that, yeah. Weren't they both involved in the Ron Paul curriculum? Like the homeschool curriculum? Yep. 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 That is so bad. Well, I mean, I get why, because Tom's a prolific math tutor, so... <laughs> yeah. That's what well, and North, well, North oh, was man. the creator of the Ron Paul curriculum, and... The more I would I'd, love to look at that. I never have. The more I, I dug know. out around about it, it's basically just a 12-year um, MLM scheme. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is the Ron Paul principle again. I think it comes down to you know, sweet, sweet dollars. Yeah, like and, classics, but and, like, Tom, and Tom really, yep, and Tom really pushed it very, very, very hard. Um, yeah. You know, they always say they study the classics, like these, you know, like right-wing homeschool guys. I'm not like I mean, homeschool, specifically talking these circles. Uh, But if you ask them a question about like Aquinas or Plato or Neoplatonic question ideals, they just, you know, can't answer them. And I'm not like going to say I'm like an expert, but like, man, if you're a Catholic homeschooler and you're talking all about, I say the classics, but if I ask you about a question about Aquinas and you can't answer, I'm just sincerely doubting how much time you're spending on the classics. Yeah, I'm afraid to see what they mean by the classics, I suppose. LewRockwell.com. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Daily Stormer. I studied the classics, that's right. And also, um, speaking of everyone being salvageable, isn't the Daily Stormer's founder's kid like a anti-racist now? I not think like, that's uh, not the Daily it, I think that was from the KKK Storm guy. Like, that's what was. Yeah, like Charles the guy found something like kids. that. That was an yeah. incredible crosstalk we just had, but I do. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was a, a KKK son of a famous KKI guy who was very rah-rah. And then he went to college and supposedly people took the time, the excruciating amount of time to talk to him and not immediately shun him. And that is another avenue that does work, but clearly it takes so much more work and so much more sort of generosity that, than a lot of us have, which is. I remember that talk you had, it was most of the campus shunned him, but then Jewish people, 
Jewish student started talking to him. I think it was specifically the the Jewish student community. That is very impressive. <laughs> but I think I think the I think the guy said it was the mix of both. It was that he was shamed by the rest of the society, okay. so the only people he could reach out to were the people that he hated. Wow, and they couldn't have that's that what. <laughs> and I'm never gonna tell like an oppressed people or a marginalized people to like hang out with their big right. But hang some out of them the choose that, that avenue, and we should. But if they applaud. choose it, good for yeah. them. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they've got the patience for it. But like when you know people are posting like you know transgender suicide memes on the internet. I mean, the internet's a cis pool, cis cis pool. cis pool. <laughs> 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 that's a good. We, uh, yeah, that's a good. That's, a, that's an, 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 an um, <laughs> accidental pun, but it's a good one. That's um, what they say it, about us, and they should. But you know, it's just, it's hard to tell people that they should hang out with people telling them to kill themselves, and I'm yeah. just like, you know. so it means they won't. The Nazis won't hang out with you, I suppose. But I imagine you'll get over that. It's such okay. a loss. It's such a hard. <laughs> loss. No, I, Nazis. And I love a good redemption story. And like, if if I like thought I could reach certain people, and I mean, I'm I've had one on one conversations with people where I do try to reach them and try to say like why do you think this here's some reasons not to think this that kind of thing but i don't i don't kid myself and think that i'm going to get through to dave smith or that i'm going to get through to molyneux or obviously someone like rockwell Mm -hmm. at at that point the people that are really up there in i don't even want to say positions of power but like positions of a lot of influence Mm -hmm. i don't think buddying up to them unless you actually really think you can change them I don't think buddying up to them is going to be the way to go because it's just going to, they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. And then if you're someone who even has any little bit of influence, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying we do, I mean like someone, someone higher up, um, buddying up to people like that will bring your fans to them and it'll introduce your fans to the more uh, objectionable aspects of, of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I had a pause. Um, I guess I was gonna try to decide what I wanted wanted to ask you guys about about the influences. Um, I have found of late that I no longer want to defend anyone to anyone because I, I it's the the cults of personality are so off putting that I never want to do that. Um, but I do want to ask if you guys have like you want to drop any names um past or present um who are doing good and who either influenced you or are influencing the confused masses towards as much as i'll argue with people from the c4ss the center for a stateless society i'll defend them from the dirty pinko allegations um, absolutely uh right. i'll defend vermin from the same dirty pinko allegations <laughs> but he's actually a like a i don't want to say friend because we don't talk much but like you know we know each other well enough to defend. Mm-hmm. And that's my thing. I'll defend people I know if if they if they've earned the defense. Sometimes yeah. my friends are yeah. shitty people. Um, <laughs> everyone's a shitty person sometimes. Uh, but yeah, that's that's about it. I don't like to spend time <laughs> defending. Pe- I don't even defend myself half the time. Sometimes, like, yeah, I'm, I'm a piece of shit. Like, you know, <laughs> the numbers of people I would defend dwindle daily. It's true. Oh, same. No, but a lot of the same people for me, uh, Vermin, the C4SS people. I would add Chase Oliver into that too. I think he's doing a pretty good job getting out I there and spreading, him yeah, he, and spreading a message of libertarianism that's not about like Jim Crow and supporting <laughs> people and and uh, liking Putin or something like that. Today like it actually, it, I know, but that's what you got to go with right now. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's actually like a libertarianism that seems like what I thought libertarianism was like a decade ago before all this Trump stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and as far as defending individual people, I think the thing to do a lot of the time is take certain, take the good things from certain people and just reject the bad. Like I could go on for a while in a conversation about Rothbard and things I like about him. And then I could go on in a conversation for a while about how terrible Rothbard is on other things. So it really, it really varies. And I just, I think it's best to not really idolize anyone or or have a hero to the extent uh that you really deify them Mm -hmm. i i think the thing to do is just view them as humans and take the good and reject the bad if you have a hero will probably ruin them for you (laughs) well i i I like spooner a lot and the more i've looked around the more i've seen that some of the 
the very people that we have been dissing that you diss all the time, they are Spooner esque in the worst way. Like they, I don't know if they read the, you know, the headlines and they took from that. Um, yeah, they'll 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 take Spooner's. The South has the right to secede, but not the John Brown also has a right to murder them. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, things like that. Or um, yeah. women, uh, the the delightfully troll e titled against uh, women's suffrage Spooner essay. And the whole thing is like women are exactly as equal as men, but no one should vote. I just think that's well presented in a way that it's not Jeremy Kaufman saying, oh, the Ninth Amendment, oh, that was a mistake. Am I right? Like, it's a different, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, People it's always... Ask. Sorry, John, go for oh, it. I was, I was just going to say, it is always interesting to me how a lot of these paleotypes seem to like Spooner. It just, it doesn't it's really, odd. it doesn't really click. I think it's the beard. Man had an it's awesome beard. not liking <laughs> women that much, maybe. He was like... Spooner appears to have been very disinterested in women in sort of a benign, I guess, way, but just, like, was not, they're, like, weren't on his radar. <laughs> but I'm sure that, you know, helps. How is his that. sexism above replacement, though? Like, was he sexist for the time? Sorry, we were... For the time, my God, no. He was yeah. completely enlightened. But um, the real MVP I've decided recently is actually Frederick Douglass, who for years didn't even get put in the, the, the libertarian category. Um, what's his name at reason? I'm blanking. I think wrote a whole book about how Frederick Douglass is a secret libertarian. And that can get tiresome when it's like, we have to claim everyone is libertarian. But the man spoke at the Seneca Falls Convention. He's like like a, a, a feminist founding mother. Like, um, And he has that whole speech about how immigration is good and stuff. Like, yeah. I think it's bad to pin. I think it's bad to pin Frederick Douglass into an ideological position instead of just the liberal tradition of America. Um, I, I think sometimes we people we venerate too much. We shouldn't ideologically pin down because then we just like try and shoehorn arguments for that ideology and say, "Oh, yeah. he would have supported this kind yeah. of thing." it's like when conservatives try and claim uh, Martin Luther King, which obviously <laughs> yes. he was nowhere near conservative. So like, it's not the same thing, but uh, they try, they try and say he would have supported this because, That's you know, true. instead of just saying he's part of the great liberal tradition of America and just leave it at that. Um, I don't know if I want to leave it at that, but I think you're generally, you're generally correct. I, I get excited when I find somebody from the 19th century oh, sure. who sounds better than people today blogging, which is bleak. <laughs> but it also proves that you know we could all be doing better in, in spite of what maybe leave it at that is reductive but um I, I think we almost demean people certain like great figures in history i hate to use the term great figures in history because it sounds like the great man theory which i'm <laughs> vehemently against but you know great figures in history if you try and pin them down ideologically you just like it's almost like reductive and just blends to an argument for that ideology instead of recognizing that person as complex um, yeah you're, yeah you're closing things off when yeah, but no, uh, my ideological hero is myself. I always like to say that. It sounds narcissistic. How very Randian of you. It's beautiful. <laughs> uh, God, no. Uh, <laughs> worst offer in literary history. Um, that isn't, she's another person who, some of my favorite people, um, often personally and, you know, anarchist and libertarianly, have a sprinkling of a love for Ayn Rand, and they're way bigger than that. But she like gave them a little influence, so like a spice, like a little sprinkling, apparently can do okay things. Um, right, Atlas Shrugged is one of two books I've never finished. The second being the Bible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really, only two. That's that's impressive. Uh, I read three uh, pages of Atlas Shrugged and, and then I fell asleep. I have like a pathological desire to like finish things, whether it's like TV shows or movies or books. Whatever, it, it can be bad. Like, it can be, like, the trashiest movie in existence, and I will finish it. Yeah. When I want to fall asleep, I just listen to a Michael Rechtenwald speech. Oh, oh yeah. But, yeah, no, it's – people like to have ideological heroes, and at the end of the day, I've learned that that's a bad thing. And I've met some of my heroes, and I've, uh, you know, not been impressed. You can do it in a less disastrous way, though. You know, I love history, and I love seeing people, like – there was a Pope in the 14th century and I'm not Catholic. I'm like, none of that, you know, who like specifically said 
it like it's it's like it's the devil's work if you're killing Jews to stop the Black Plague because that's not it's yeah. my official popely doctrine, and obviously that's better than you know, um, twenty. You know, I mean, like I don't know. Like there are people who I can look at and be like, oh, they knew something that you don't think people a million years ago knew, but you can't deify them as one perfect thing. Oh, I will recognize people as heroes for their actions. I think it's recognizing them as heroes for their ideological, like, affinity yeah. or contributions. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I John Brown was a theocrat. But, like, did he kill slavers also? Yes. I'm genuinely conflicted about John Brown, and I can own that. Um, but, <laughs> um, in part because, you know, the first person killed at the raid was a freed black guy. Like, yes. What a phenomenal PR win for the South for that. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually the, a really condescending The racist really won that one. In tribute of him, in Harper's Ferry, that's like... He was a credit to his race. He's our favorite black guy. It's horrible. It's so I'm condescending sure it was, like, and on purpose. By, I'm pretty sure it was funded by like the daughters of the Confederacy too. It certainly reads that way, and th- there's yeah. no plaque to contextualize that plaque. And I stood there reading it, and a woman read it and was like, "Oh, that's nice." Like guilelessly, yeah. just like, hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not saying he was exactly like the best planner. Um, <laughs> that's yeah. for sure. But he did some pretty wicked things with a broadsword. Is all I'll say. <laughs> I mean, you know, my man like Raoul Wallenberg um, had you know had some racist moments when he was like in South Africa and was like a rich guy who didn't know what to do in life. Like, but whenever you save scores of thousands of people's lives, you really get like you're pretty much in the win yeah. column there. Regardless, and Tito's of- in that weird spot for me because like horrible, horrible dictator, yes, but also like. Did he free his country from Nazis with very little outside help? Also, uh, yes. I mean, I've always heard of him as the least bad version of the bad class, but I yeah, I he also helped much. a lot of Soviet citizens like get out to the West. Um, Fair enough. Because he hated Stalin. Was, what was Tito he... threatened to kill Stalin? Actually, he should have gone for it. <laughs> well, Stalin tried to kill him three times. Tito wrote him a letter saying, I'll send an assassin once to Moscow and won't send a second. Damn. Um, but no, I mean, again, <laughs> Yugoslavia, and like, I just have this weird thing because it's like, it's the one country that basically freed itself with minimal allied and Soviet support. So mm-hmm. it's like, he killed a lot of Nazis, like at the end of the day. I mean, I, I know I've heard people say, um, you know, all the stuff about him holding Yugoslavia together and how before the early nineties, people were all hanging out with the different ethnicities and they weren't really worrying about it too much, but, um, yeah, there's minimal truth to that. There's some really, okay. There's some, but not as much as people like to say, but I I guess that's where I am. I, I don't worship people for their ideological, like amazingness. I'm just like, Hey, if you've done cool things in your life and it's worth like recognizing as heroic, go for it. But other than that, Oscar Schindler was a was an asshole and was really uh, mean to his wife, um, which made him a great movie subject, you know? <laughs> Do you all continue... It seems like you continue to identify as libertarian. Um, I mean, you're called fakertarians, and yet you seem to be libertarians, which... How about that? But what... As someone who also cannot give the label up... Are you going to stick with that? Like, is there anything that's going to make so, you actually throw out that word? So I stick with it, but then I feel like when I meet someone for the first time and say that I'm a libertarian, I just have to be like, not that kind of libertarian. <laughs> and I, I highlight the viewpoints that differentiate myself from those kinds of libertarians. Yeah. Like I talk about being uh, pro-immigration and pro-choice and uh, against police brutality and all of that. So I kind of lead with the things that the term libertarian might make, might make people think I had a different view. Mm -hmm. Um, I lead with the things where I'm like, okay, I'm this kind of libertarian. But then also, obviously I think there's a bunch of horrible libertarians and we can argue about whether they're actually libertarians or not, but that really just comes down to semantics. I mean, the point is 
I do not, I, I feel like a lot of these, a lot of these types, the paleos, I just don't feel like I actually share an ideology with them. No. Yeah. I yeah. That, yeah. I don't think you do. You want to go next, Jeremy? Sure. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I would still identify as a libertarian. I think I tend to come off because, you know, just because it, it sparks so much, um, usually, you know, distaste or, you know, people just, you know, obvi- immediately think, you know, Republican that wants to smoke weed or, you know, those kind of, um, you know, f- feelings right away. I, I usually tend to lead off with, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, come from a, you know, liberty minded um, viewpoint. Um, and I, I think that settles and sits better with, with people. Um I mean, because I am my own person and I have my own opinions and, you know, and how things should, how things should work. And, um, but I think ultimately still, I, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm a libertarian at heart and probably always will be, um, you know, even, even if I'm not, uh, within whatever, you know, whatever libertarianism is the, these days to, to the general public. Mm-hmm. Um, I've kind of abandoned the term to describe myself publicly, I guess. I say that I use it as a lens of critique. Um, even if, cause I oftentimes will disagree with like the generally acceptable libertarian answer a lot, some of the time, enough of the time where I question if I should use the term, Mm -hmm. especially in regards to who has now control of the term. Maybe I'll come back to it. Maybe I won't. Uh, I call myself anarcho neoliberal to piss people off. Uh, same with state capacity libertarian, just to scratch people's heads, make people scratch their heads. <laughs> yeah, that one's making me scratch, scratch my head a little bit. Oh, I just do it to like make people question their sanity. Um, <laughs> I kind of like uh, the radical liberal um, mm-hmm. as one, mostly because people come with preconceived notions of what that means, and it's fun to uh, beat them over the head with it. Um yeah, I mean, I'm just too heterodoxical to use a label for myself um, in regards to any one ideology. And so I just, again, that's why maybe I say my greatest ideological influence is myself. Um, it's a little narcissistic, yeah. Maybe, oh, that's where we started on the, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's a little narcissistic, but I think it's actually true. Um, I don't read, I'm illiterate. I, uh, I, I <laughs> We talk about the reactionaries who only read No Treason and maybe his article on uh, women's suffrage, but that's actually more than I've read of Spooner because I've only read No Treason. Okay, um, but you are in law school and I hear there's a lot of reading in law school. Yeah. Is this not you know, I, I don't know how I get through law school as an illiterate uh, person, but um, it, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't read. I don't have time to read. I just read for law school. But, uh, you know, I, I think people attach too much credence to labels. Uh, I think it's often destructive unless I'm giving them out to people because I'm always right. Uh, That's true. That is true. Yeah, I mean, I've used the word libertarian since I had any label for anything. But I took and then trashed anarcho-capitalist and a large percentage of the credit for the trashing goes to Christopher Cantwell directly. Oh, God. Yeah. Just to see yeah, how yeah. tragic and horrible <laughs> he is in every way and what happened with that, with that word. Um, yeah, so... Yeah. The libertarian, <laughs> there's something about it. I mean, people always like I used to argue with my social anarchist cousin about libertarian and how he preferred the European definition, you know, and people hate on the American version. Yeah. And I think it's sad. Last year, I considered myself more anarchist than I would today and probably don't even consider myself one today, even if I like to Jeez, imagine that's quite I... a year you had then. If that's, um... <laughs> um, I, I would like to see anarchism work. Uh, in society to approach that kind of thing i'm just you know i used to believe in rothbard's button and uh now i don't so now i question i guess is the right way to say it uh the, but the make I, the state it, go away button yeah it was easier to call myself an anarchist in law school and to lawyers than it was to call myself a libertarian uh they were more That's, receptive to, they were wow. more receptive to anarchist than libertarian and I, I think if, if that shows just how denigrated the term has become my public defender friend claims that libertarians in the office are common, but which is they are. Yeah, I'm okay. at a public defender's office right now. So, but um, the the button, of course, 
there's that's a bit at odds in the sense that well I don't know what the, I don't remember exactly what the button does but I I have some caveats for the button too because that you get a lot of bizarre every if the state is illegitimate everything it does is equally bad sort of uh um, yeah. mumbo jumbo and that doesn't yeah not, I like to call reality. myself a radical practicalist or maybe a um in uh an insane uh incrementalist uh for alliterative <laughs> use but um yeah i don't know i'd say we yeah. cut the libraries second last and then the public defenders last because that is direct <laughs> defense against the state so you really you need to keep that yeah. Why yeah. maybe like the child health care programs you know you know, we can keep those, for instance, until the for end. For now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, John, am I hallucinating, or are you quoted in the Southern Poverty Law Center a couple of times? I am. About, is it Cantwell and uh, everyone's fake um, Roman dictator, uh, Augustus Invictus? Um, I don't remember if I was quoted on those so, two or not. Okay. I know I was quoted in the in the article about the Mises Caucus, but I have I did write an article about Invictus uh, a few months before Charlottesville, actually. Okay, I guess I, I'm I read all three of the things though, and but the um the Cantwell and Invictus things I thought, and then you being quoted and you being you know talked about in a respectful sort of way, it almost to me looks like the Southern Poverty Law Center had to differentiate between you and Christopher Cantwell. Because on their worst day, I think they would call you and him, you know, everyone's a horrible far right person. They're all mm. painted with the same brush. So sometimes the horrible influx of people is almost making it possible for you to stand out more as people who are obviously not as bad. And in a bizarre way, is that helping the reputation a little bit of libertarianism? I do think it's good to show that there are libertarians that aren't like Cantwell or Invictus. Um, and when I had, so there was a Mises, uh, or a Mises Caucus article that came out uh, a little bit before the 2022 Libertarian Convention. And I was in contact with a Southern Poverty Law, Poverty Law Center reporter about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I had some long talks with him and he definitely viewed me as a lot different from the Mises caucus people, because there were some rumblings. I knew about this, uh, before, before the article came out, because I actually approached this journalist, uh, with the Lou Rockwell daily stormer story. Okay. And then he, I talked to them a little bit and he's like, what's this about the Mises caucus? And there were some rumblings that. Um, that the SPLC was going to come out and say the Libertarian Party in general is like a hate group. Um, and that's before <laughs> that's before the Mises caucus even took over. And he was like, no, I'm not I'm not going to do that. And yeah. the way he he did differentiate some of us from the Mises caucus people. So it's like there's he was showing, which is the truth, mm -hmm. that there are different factions in the Libertarian Party. And I do think, especially with how public the Hoppian, whatever you want to call it, call it Hoppian alt-right paleo aspect of the libertarian movement is uh, out there right now. I do think it's important to present the differing view. And that's what you're doing, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah, what I... Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird line to walk of trying to not give legitimacy to those people while also being a legitimate alternative. Yeah. Um. I don't think it's a difficult line to walk so much. It's just one you have to conscientiously think of when you make certain statements or do certain actions. I feel like sometimes there, again, to be maybe overly charitable, people are afraid that to face up to the, the, the rot, the unlibertarian parts, you are somehow acknowledging the, 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 the critics of libertarianism altogether. You're, but I mean, you're betraying them. You're like, you're, 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 we're supposed to all stand together somehow. Yet at the same time, these are the people I'm pushing that, Jeremy off the cliff first, actually. <laughs> that, that at best seem to think that women, uh, trans people, various uh, ethnic minorities, if they run a gamut of nastiness and cruelty, and then they, you know, then they make it, then I guess they can be libertarians, kind of. But 
God forgive forbid we welcome them in any fashion whatsoever. Yeah, um, I, I think the question is, sometimes the critics are right. Yeah, it took um, me a long time to get <laughs> as comfortable with that fact as I am today. And at the end of the day, I have, you know, gay, black, and trans friends that we can argue about tax policy, healthcare policy, and guns. But um, when libertarians are trying to get me to side with, like, exclusionary potentially genocidal or cleansing policies like i i mean florida just passed that driver's license or there's a driver's license bill in the florida house that would uh call it criminal fraud for a trans person to label their gender identity as their gender on their driver's license yep and i'm like yeah sorry i don't care if you think guns are cool or like the surveillance state is bad man like because you're it's, you're supporting the even larger state at the end of the day, so I mean that that is the surveillance state, of course, yeah. right. you know, yeah. and the idea that it's not is is completely unrelated to the real world and how these things go. They don't want the FBI to spy on the John Birch Society. They they want them to spy. Uh, they want them to spy on Martin Luther King and kill Fred Hampton. Correct, um, which they did. So yeah, wow, I mean we're on a <laughs> we're on a roll here, or you know the the. the I thought book bans were over a couple of years ago. Well, I mean, I was dead wrong about that. Um, and if you tell them what books the Nazis burned early, the the best ones are like, yeah, the Nazis were based in that one way by burning. Yeah. Uh, what was the library? What was the next library. Um, I know that was always uh, Peter. What's his name? Peter Quinones's. One of oh, his fuck things that about guy. That. I know. <laughs> Chris called him. Yeah. He's gone full on Nazi now. Like he's not even he's not even hiding it anymore. I never wow. even met people. What a not shock. Like almost <laughs> like there was evidence earlier that, that oh, I know. I've never even met people who liked him. They're like even when they, he was like less reactionary and they agreed with him, they're like, Yeah, but he's a douchebag. Like, <laughs> yeah, he was always a douche, but he actually and I used to point to this. There was this podcast episode he had about uh, attacking the Hoppian immigration idea where he brought on, I forget who he brought on, but it was something about the argument about how people from other countries are, are paying. I don't remember if it was tariffs or what, I don't remember the exact substance of it, but it was actually like a really interesting episode about how mm. other people could be net taxpayers or, or victims of the state. And then he just, and he, but he was always kind of edge lord. I was like, okay. I, Cause he actually came into Fakertarian's discussion group, maybe like, 2018 2019 and just post post really edgy memes and i feel like a lot of us just kind of ignored him and then he went way hard on the hoppa stuff and freaking out about and now he's just freaking out about black people all the time and and the jews and, and all that stuff so i saw it coming a mile away but yeah. people don't people aren't willing to identify it and i've had this problem in the past too where i was like oh yeah this person's not that bad and then they turn out to really be that bad, but people don't want to see it until it's like really staring you in the face. I, I mean, many, a couple of years ago, Oh, Jordan Peterson is a classical <laughs> liberal. Obviously it's the Dave Rubin. It's the Dave Rubin phenomenon. Yeah. I've... Dave Rubin is at least truly dumb. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you guys, like, I'm still thinking of our, not imaginary, because they also exist, like, as social anarchist listeners and stuff. And, like, I, you, maybe you've answered this already, but, like, do you feel like you're on their side in some way? I mean, do you fear tankies or are, are true, like, anarch, I don't know, what kind of communists, but, like, statist, socialist communists, what have you? Um, is there some line there with how you feel allied with them that, that you wouldn't cross? I'll ask them two questions. It's one, do you believe in left unity? And the second is, how do you view the Spanish Republicans in the Civil War, especially the CNTFII? And okay. I, I think the way they answer those two questions will tell me everything I need to know about them. All right, well, we'll have to have them answer that then, I guess. I would say, obviously, I'm very against tankies and all of that, but I feel like I have more in common as I call myself like a market anarchist now because I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but I feel like I have more in common with like a mutualist or an anarcho-socialist than I do with someone alt-right or paleo or something like that. Sure. I feel like we at least have, even if we have some disagreements on things, I feel like 
even just like on a human decency standard, caring about people, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't view that. I view them as well for the vast majority. I view them as kind of like just a different flavor of political view more than actually seeing them as evil or something like I do the alt right. Oh yeah, generally speaking, even when they answer my questions wrong, I'll generally still trust them more, or like them more than the average reactionary or alt right person. Um, yeah, unless they answer my questions really wrong, and then it's <laughs> then I don't. Oh yeah, if and if it's the tankies and stuff, that's no. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, do you want? Do you have any? Um, I not much to add. John pretty much, you know, pretty much said what what I would say is, you know, and and that is true. I, I tend to have. You know, or find myself more in agreement and can at least interact with um mm -hmm. you know people um in different flavors versus i mean people that just don't see you know me or my friends or other people as i mean as humans um at least not fully not like they are i guess yeah right you know it's you know, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I, I'm gay. You, you have to you have to deal with that, and <laughs> you know you you can't. Yes, they do. Yeah, you can't. You, if you're gonna if you're gonna brand me as some sort of you know groomer, pedophile, whatever, and just completely, um, you know, up to wishing you know just death on me. You know, I, I'm not gonna. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna deal with that. Nope. And we already fucking did that um, with Anita Bryant and all that stuff. Um, like, even I'm, I mean, the, Alec is the baby on this podcast, but like, hey. all of this has happened before. <laughs> and I, I have to be reminded time and again. Um, I was actually amazed how many people hated Anita Bryant back when she was making a fuss. It's almost almost encouraging. But yet, you know, we're, we're, we're doing it again and people are so easily fooled. And it's very yeah. disturbing. Um, but it took me way too long to get to this basic, um, way of looking at things, which Jesse Walker from reason, um, put it to me, maybe on the first podcast I did on this show, you know, just like the tankies are much farther from the corridors of power than like Stephen Miller was, you know, yeah. Yeah. clearly <laughs> those people are, have so much more power and the democratic equivalent, you can call them, you know, Obama, a raving communist all you like, but realistically, that's not true. Um, and I still have tanky friends, and I don't have, like, Nazi friends. So if that says anything, like, they may be shitty people, or they may have really shitty ideas and, like, morally questionable on certain aspects, but I don't believe that they're going to commit a genocide over arbitrary characteristics like race or... It's pretty you know. hard to figure out how you can fool yourself about nazism as compared to fooling yourself about collective Station. farming <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is a very bad idea but i mean i can see how maybe you can get there beyond i would like to kill all those people um let's do two more things if we can um i'm gonna put you on the spot by asking for like a media recommendation um for you know based on what we've talked about based on what influences you like what should what should the good listeners read or watch or etc are we allowed to self-promote here or no <laughs> well i'm gonna let you do that anyway so at the end the very very end um so you should be magnanimous and, and suggest something else but i mean i don't know john you want to go or sure i mean i would recommend people check if if you're saying like other like libertarianism resources or yeah, or I mean, mean like you know if you wanted to say all I can think of now is no treason, but just like anything along those lines, directly ideologically influential or more broadly, you know. I would say I would advise, and I mean I imagine some people watching this have already have, but I would advise people to check out C4SS. Um, it definitely helped get me off the. Uh, the, I don't consider myself like right wing or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that definitely helped me not consider myself right wing because it, it showed me there was a bigger difference between being a libertarian and just a run of the mill Republican or something like that than I even thought at the time. Mm -hmm. And also, also the Lou Rockwell Mighty Ducks 2 article. You should check that out. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. I will, do that. I will definitely do that. 
Um, I'm going to go a non-libertarian answer. Uh, okay. I think there's some good stuff from liberal currents. I think that they do that some good writing. Uh, I really like Matt McManus or McManus. He's a, uh, like a, he writes a lot about like liberal libertarian socialism and, okay. uh, disagree with him a lot, but he still has some really good and insightful work. I, I find the most insightful things to be people I disagree with. Um, I really interact a lot with people in like housing and immigration policy, Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, so just find stuff there. And if you want to actually watch white people suffer, watch Iowa college football and then specifically (laughs) watch their offense. If you really think that there's like some like plan against white people to make them suffer, just watch Iowa college football. I think it's basically the same thing. If I watch any football, the other another person will be able to see a white person suffering. <laughs> I hate football so much. Um, but, and then yeah, just the Iowa football. offensive scheme. I think that's the best emblem of white people suffering in this country. Just like, okay. I'll try. It's, it's funny if you like college football. Mm-hmm. As well. I believe you. I guess. <laughs> Jeremy. Okay. Um, so for for me, um, I probably would recommend um, uh, Seri- Serious Trouble, which is a um, podcast by Ken White or Pope Hat, mm, as, Pope Hat. Um, as many know, um, especially for just kind of learning how things work and, you know, especially why, you know, the law works the way it does and how it does. And um, very, very good, um, very good a lot of legal explainer type stuff um and then another one um the the unpopulist mm-hmm. um is Both is definitely. great um great lots of great reads there i approve of all of these recommendations except for the football um, <laughs> i'm lucy all of your takes are just you hate aaron sorkin you hate college you hate football yeah i hate america Aren't you are a communist yet? lucy yeah i love Football is too dangerous to be as boring as it is to watch because it's boring, but it you gives hate you football too, don't you? Uh, plus, it's Pittsburgh, like football poisoning, football poisoning everywhere. It's a terrible football town. I hate it. I'm supposed to ask the obligatory question, truly, to wrap it up, which, well, I'm supposed to ask in your political utopia, how would I? get a cappuccino which is very abrupt on this uh talk we've had but people yell at me if i don't ask it so i don't know what to tell you <laughs> you'd uh you'd exchange something of value for it whatever you're willing to trade and whoever they're willing to accept sold are you talking uh which are you talking about by the way um the one at non-servium who probably doesn't want me to bandy his name about on the okay. air but also <laughs> Could edit it out, but don't worry about it. I'll I'll shoot you a like... DM later. I'm curious. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone else has any market anarchistic ways to buy their cappuccinos, but <laughs> however you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody else. Maybe I'll tell you to buy a monster energy drink and grab a pack of cigarettes like a real adult, but you know, uh, <laughs> those are gross. Well, no, as I not. as I drink one. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Just really, yeah. Health, health food is good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's it's hard to. I I can't. Um. You know, I can't predict how people will will um. Uh, or would behave in a in a theoretic, um, type of society, and so it's it's a really hard answer for me to give. Um. Even if it is my ideal society, I still can't control the people within it or how. Um, systems or institutions form and evolve um, over time and so I'm just legit gonna say I don't have an answer because I don't know and it's just not a question that I'm able to answer but that was still a good it was a Hayekian <laughs> answer it was beautiful My... um you always you always get a good answer even when I think I won't I always do. Jeremy doesn't want to be a dictator and that's where he and I disagree oh dear <laughs> lord um yes my child <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, okay can we now y'all can promote yourself and libertarians to your heart's content um jeremy do you know all of our social media handles because i know we have a bunch and it just gets reposted there because there's like i know the twitter and the facebook twitter is 
at Fakertarians. There's Facebook, the facebook.com slash at Fakertarians. There's Fakertarians.com, which has some articles on it. And then we have a bunch of other things that I don't totally know. Also, about. if you Google Fakertarians, Dave Smith's Wikipedia page is one of the first results, which I kind of yeah. love. <laughs> Me too. That's good. I think uh, Tom Woods a, comes up a lot too. There's a blue sky. Uh, I don't know what the at is, and I'm too lazy to pull up blue sky. There's, there's, a Reddit. Have, there's a Mastodon, I believe. I yeah, follow dude. you guys all over the whole internet. I'm yep. pretty sure. Most there's, of our stuff Mastodon. is yeah, most of our stuff is at Fakertarians or Fakertarians. Um, um you know, because Twitter's the best place. Yeah, Twitter's generally where we're most we're most active. Mastodon and Blue Sky um are usually just kind of retreads of our of our Twitter um feeds. Um but yeah, then our podcast, wherever you get your podcasts and um that's pretty much yeah that pretty much covers it um because there's i mean there's you know there's there's no other there's really no other uh confusion with any other kind of fake fakertarians out there so just <laughs> Not people think plucking, we're, plucking yeah, us yeah, into people, google and and finding um people uh think we're we're liberty hangout sometimes i've gotten that before. Ew, yeah because oh, of, cool. of the logo they're like didn't you guys support the wall or something like that yeah, you could maybe maybe tweak that logo. If, you know, <laughs> it is a little uh, a little outdated now. It's a little that, dated, uh, yeah. I mean, now that Liberty oh, Hangout actually, pretty much doesn't exist anymore. They've even locked their Twitter account. There is a god after all. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll shamelessly self promote myself as a. Oh yeah. I don't funny. know if these two will, but uh, I'm a little bit more you. separate than those two are from the account. Uh, it's at Alec J14 on Twitter. Okay. Uh, don't try and find my last name, and if you do, like, nope. good for you. I guess you won't be able to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Secret <laughs> um, defense. I tweet about Iowa football, uh, beer, um, liberty, uh, bully, racist on there. It's a good time. Fair enough. Yeah. And you got you got lectured by Tom Woods once. Yeah, funny. there is uh, Tom Woods called me an alcoholic and basically a virgin, and he was right about <laughs> one of those things. <laughs> The listeners can decide. <laughs> well, I mean, I've spent time with Tom Woods' mom, so decide about which one of those is true. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm at student. at Jumbo Jumbo Jeremy is my is my Twitter um, handle, and I, I don't really do anything specific on there. Um, so, but <laughs> fair enough. Okay. <laughs> nothing, yeah. nothing specific. I aimed on on that account. I'm pretty much all over the place. So, yeah, I'm I'm at John M Hudak, but usually I'm just tweeting out whatever I feel like from Fakertarians because it's just like my stream of consciousness, basically. All right, yeah. that sounds good. I will endorse the following. If you want to see some trolley pr- principle trolling in action, it's it's good to watch sometimes. I think it's made me a little more confrontational in a good way um so i i, I wholeheartedly endorse the fakertarians uh mission and you can follow non-servium on all manner of things blue sky mastodon twitter um non-servium media on twitter and you can follow me on twitter lucy stag i've actually using blue sky more um so for me at least that's actually that's actually the new twitter but this was very fun as usual i have worn myself into exhaustion and eat water and stuff so i'm gonna wrap this thing up but this was a lot of fun i was very happy to be here me all of you so thank you thank you for having us on you're listening to the non-servian podcast if you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much. <laughs>